So my trainers at AK Thailand, their number one goal is customer experience. Understand your customer, know what your customer wants. And if they leave with a smile, you do your job. Welcome to Fruiting Body Podcast with your host, Brendan. We are a medicinal mushroom company located in Phuket, Thailand. And today we have an absolute legend of a guest. It is Mike Swick, the legendary uh, UFC fighter that came from the Ultimate Fighter 1. And we're going to talk a lot about that. But more importantly, this podcast is for anyone that wants to hear Mike's story of why he came to Phuket, Thailand and started up AKA Thailand. And without further ado, let's get this started. Okay. A lot of uh, hype. Yeah, a lot, a lot of hype. Of hype man. I, I, I'll be honest, like, I turn into that, like, radio show guy at the beginning. Oh, I don't know how to turn it off. I appreciate it. And then, and then it just kind of fades away. Oh, I think anyone good. doing a podcast, it's like you, you turn this character on, but it's not you. Yeah. And then it's like, because how else do you do the intro? It, it, I, I it wish I weird, do but I, like, I don't, like, I never think about me being a fighter mm. in Thailand, ever. Even at the gym, and until someone comes up to me and they're like, oh, I watched your fight, or I saw this, or that, or the other... I never think about it for some reason. It's, it's like never in my head. When you, when you came over here initially, you you were doing training? Because I saw you were doing the training at AKA in, in the U.S. And yeah. then that transitioned over here. So yeah. um, why, don't we, why don't you tell that story of how that all connected and what brought you to Thailand and opening up AKA? Well, Javier formed American Kickboxing Academy, which turned into AK for short. But we, we kind of co-founded together as a fight team uh, the MMA team of AKA, Team AKA, like the brand. So, and if I sound raspy and, and horror star, guys, I'm, I didn't sleep. So I'm full energy. I just sound probably a little rough. Yeah, and don't, where's your water? I don't drink. So I don't think I'm like a hungover or something like that. Um, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. So, so, uh, so he, he founded American Kickboxing Academy and then we, we trained out of there and we did BJJ, we did everything and we just kind of formulated, uh, AKA and, and built the team amongst ourselves and that's how it started and so the, the core members you know just uh who, who is it jo josh uh Kotschek, uh Kotschek? he wasn't a core member the core the core core members were like it was like me thompson trevor prangley paul buenatello bobby southworth uh brian johnson obviously frank shamrock was there even before ak so frank shamrock was there when i went so I went to AK or American Kickboxing Academy to train with Frank Shamrock under Team Shamrock. Okay. So he was the team. Well, was it established as MMA at that point? Yeah. Or still just kind of well, he was kickboxing. The he he brought MMA gotcha. to, to Brian Johnson brought it, and then Frank blew it up. And what five -time what year would that have been? Now you're oh talking pre 2005. Yeah, oh yeah, I was in the UFC in 2005. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So we're talking like I tried out for the team in 1998, I think. Jesus Christ. And then I had to wait to come back till 1999 or something to move there. Mm. And that was when it was Shamrock. And then I moved there, and then Frank left the gym, and we had a choice to go with Frank or to stay with AKA with Hoff, and there was nobody famous with us. So we had to either go with the famous guy or stay amongst ourselves and just form our own team, and we formed AKA. And Frank's gym was this also. Now, AKA is in San Jose, correct? Yeah. Was it always there? Because you're coming from Texas, so I'm trying to connect those points yeah. from Texas to Frank to San Jose. It, it was always there. I was just a big fan of Frank, and uh, okay. he was training there. So he did open tryouts. You could go try out for his team, be on, a, you know, be on the fight team. And so I went and I tried out, got the shit kicked out of me, and, yeah, I made it and passed. And it just took me another year to save up enough money to actually go and live in the most explicit expensive place in, in america the silicon valley yeah i don't know you know it sucks that that's where our gym was but uh it was a struggle to to train and and fight when it pay at that time was so low and the economy was so high you know with all these dot yeah, coms. especially like uh just coming in, in into mma like again like <clears throat> you said the pay was yeah. definitely not extravagant um yeah. but you're, you're coming from a like a taekwondo back yep. more of a striking background um Let's go back to younger Mike, younger than that. H how did you initially get into martial arts and Taekwondo and what led you to kind of pursuing MMA? A lot of it, I won't get into details, but a lot of it stemmed from my father and then, and then I, I was in Taekwondo and I wanted to just pursue uh, something to the fullest to maximize my potential 
after. You know, I, I knew that no form of martial arts is going to be a career for me anyway. Um, it was a stepping stone to try to do something after. So my goal was to get as, as famous and as, you know, known as possible to help use that or make as much money as I can to use that to help then do something after fighting. Um, you know, we couldn't, we couldn't foresee the UFC getting as big as it did and ultimate fighter and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, I, we had Chuck Norris, so he was kind of one that made it out and, and, and did movies and did stuff like that. So he used martial arts as a stepping stone to get into movies. So it was kind of like, that was my start. Um, and yeah, I just, I kept pursuing it and it just, I just loved it. I, I, I wasn't a violent person. I didn't get in fights on the street, but just when it came to competitive fighting, it was just, you know, I could do it. I was very competitive. Yeah, I, I was listening to an interview that you did. I, I well, Usually if, if uh, people are yourself, there's a lot of content. So I can go back to videos 13 yeah. years old. And you're kind of saying like with Taekwondo and martial arts, this is a very disciplined martial art. And then as you pursued MMA and you went into the ring and you got guys with red mohawks in the crowd yeah, yeah. throwing beer yeah, and yeah. screaming, you kind of asked yourself, also, what am, what, the I hell am I doing? what the hell are you doing here? Well, why am I entertaining these guys? They're throwing beer cans at me as I'm walking out. How, how did that all connect together in terms of the Taekwondo to the, to that, the aspect of MMA? How did you make that transition and that decision besides just the stepping stone? Like, what was that? Uh, the question is more, what was that first step, that leap? I just wanted to be known as, as being strong and, and good at something and being the best at what I did. And I knew Taekwondo wasn't the ultimate form of fighting. And when I saw ultimate fighting, I knew that was obviously. So I wanted to be the guy where I could show up at a UFC event or something. And people was like, Oh, that guy, he fights here. He's a good fighter. You know, that, that, that was kind of my dream. Um, but in the, in between stages, you know, these small shows, you know, you walk out and, and guys are throwing beer cans at you. And, and, you know, I'd have quit probably 10 times had it not been that I won the fight. But it's like you walk out, and the whole time you're just demoralized. You're just like, what am I doing? Why am I entertaining these guys? You know, and, and fighting this guy with a you know, cut-off shorts and a mohawk. And, yeah. you know, the guy looks like he's high on drugs. And But then you win, and you're like, wow, that was easy. That was fun. And so it was addictive. And so then I wanted to do it one more time, and one more time, one more time. And then eventually it got just less and less trashy and more classy and more prestigious. And then... You just it just kept evolving and i just got f in that wormhole yeah because you're you're going into uh mma at a very early stage and i'm assuming a lot of the people that you were your, your opponents didn't have those sharpened tooled mma skills or like martial arts such as taekwondo were most of those people you're initially like competing against were they essentially uh street bra brawlers in that sense where yeah. they just wanted to hey get me in the cage i want to fight or at that early or at that early stages of MMA were you also competing against similar people like yourself there wasn't many of us there, there was more people that were like bouncers that took like three jujitsu classes yeah and and wanted to just beat up everyone um so I racked up like a 21 and one amateur record something like that and I, and I had no ground skills at all like nothing I was wearing I wore red karate pants it never went to the ground, I'm assuming, most of the time. Yeah, yeah. I had great takedown defense by then because they were trying to take me down. But it was like I wore literally red karate pants to fight because I didn't even go to the ground um, in most of my amateur fights. And then moved into pro. And then actually I, I started out with uh, three guys, Eve Edwards, who made it to UFC, yeah. and Lynn Oding, who just left Thailand. Um, he's a famous director now. He's So his we all started at the same time, and me and Eve's goal was to go in the UFC – and, and use that as our stepping stone to, to become something. Um, and then Lynn wanted to be in film. So he was always going to, I think it was uh, Fort Worth or Austin to, to film Texas uh, Ranger with, or uh, Walker, Texas Ranger with uh, Chuck Norris. Wow, really? He was a stuntman, yeah. So he went stuntman, then he became a stunt coordinator. And now he's a director. So he's like a big, big shot director in Hollywood, yeah. He's, dir he's directing Reacher, actually, this, this second season. Ja Re that's not, no, I'm thinking Jack Reacher. I think that's it. It is, Jack Reacher. Tom, is it Tom Cruise movie? No, no, no. It's the TV show now. Ah, yeah. Okay, okay. He does like all the major TV shows and stuff. And, and he did the movie with uh, Jason Momoa, Braven. So he, he just left here, actually. Is it, how long was he training with you or kind of just uh, on vacation? Yeah, yeah. He was with me and Dan. So he, ah, okay. he comes with Dan. He's friends with Dan as well. Okay. So he was here with Dan and I. And uh, so, so yeah, we all, we all kind of made it in our, as our goal. So it's kind of cool. But that's who we started out with back in like 1996, 1997, fighting in rodeo okay. arenas. 
like high school gymnasium, underground ago. fights. The rules changed every time we'd show up. We had no idea what the rules were. Sometimes it's like you could punch the face, full underground. Sometimes it's like open hand to the face. Sometimes you can't punch to the face, but you could knee and kick to the face. And we're just like, what? You can knee and kick to the face, but you can't even open hand. It's, it's so weird. Especially when you're in that like a very high intense environment, the ability to understand the rules is it's probably quite difficult. It changed every time, and we didn't know who our opponents were either. Yeah. So uh, yeah, you're saying some of the fights, sizes, different yeah. opponents, different. I mean, everything was just like chaos. At, at which point did you know, getting into martial arts, that you had to focus more on on the ground game and the wrestling, which is what AKA in AKA. The, is famous for. When I moved to AKA. And that, that was purely to sharpen that skill? No, no. I moved there because of Frank. Just because? Okay. But then as it turned out, when Frank left and then AK formed its own team, it became primarily wrestlers. So we had Fitch, Koscheck come in, DC came in, Kane came in, and it was just became like a wrestling haven. So I didn't want to be a wrestler. I didn't want to take people down, but it was great takedown defense. So it was, that, that's why my takedown defense in the UFC was very high yeah. because I had some of the best wrestlers in the world trying to take me down. And it was helping me defend against it. Mm -hmm. So I could do what I wanted to do, which was stand. I love striking. So that's why I came to Thailand um, for 20 years, since, since 1999, um, before every fight. I came to Thailand. I would do Muay Thai. But then I'd have to retrain myself in my stance and, and, and my fundamentals of MMA and then mix it together and take what I could use from Muay Thai and throw away what I couldn't use in order to put that into my fights. So and my goal is to eventually build a gym that I could, that I could just – do everything and actually do a full UFC fight camp in Thailand. And and because of Taekwondo, Muay Thai, and then MMA, the distance control, the stance, it's all completely different if, well, if you're a fan and you're watching yeah. it. Um, as you're you're coming to, to Thailand to, to train Muay Thai, and again, your background is Taekwondo, so you, you have that, that base. Mm -hmm. um, is it difficult then to adjust when you go back to the U.S. and get into an MMA uh, competition because you're training so long on this MMA stance and the distance, everything's completely different? Super different. Yeah, very difficult. Um, I mean, it got easier over time because as I'm learning from the Muay Thai instructors, I'm kind of like putting in the back of my mind just to kind of like let that go. It's not useful. Um so it got easier, but yeah, it, it was confusing, and, and that's why I wanted to build a gym that understood how to train an MMA fighter. Um, but when we get into it, why I built AK Thailand was from an entrepreneurial uh, position, not a fight gym. Position. Yeah, so yeah, um, and that's the point of this podcast. Again, as we kind of explain, it's like we're connecting to that. So you've come here, you've done the training, you're back at AKA, you're getting your MMA. Uh, um, and your, your career is going well as, as, as well as you were like a top, top uh, contender on the ultimate, ult, ultimate Fighter Season 1. When was that transition and uh, making that decision as a businessman to, okay, I think it's time I'm going to move to Thailand and, you know, create this uh, extended franchise of AKA yeah. in Thailand? And just if you can explain that story. I was always thinking about business. So midway through my career, I started building a print shop. And I built a, a very successful large print shop in Northern California. Um, I eventually sold it in 2018. Um, but that was my first taste of business. And I knew that I had to build something big. And my dream was to build this big gym in, in Thailand. And it was unlike anything that anyone expected. And everyone thought I was crazy. I mean, if you, if, if you look at it, like I was talking to Daniel Cormier and some of the guys on my team when I said I was going to build a, a Muay Thai gym in Thailand. And they're just like, dude, th there's zero reason you're too smart for that. Why, what the hell are you doing? You have a successful print shop. Why are you going to Thailand? You're going to a country with the most Muay Thai gyms in the world and you're American and you're going to build a Muay Thai gym. And it's also one of the lowest economy countries, you know, so there's, there's not much economy there to make money. Um, th there was so many things, so much, so many different things going against the, 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 the building of this gym there. Um, but there was, was there much competition? Like now was Tiger established? There was no competition like, and nobody knew that. And that's what I wanted. Yeah. Because everyone assumed, which is what I wanted, um, my, my goal was this. Like, my brain thinks differently. So I break things down. I don't, I don't just, like, memorize and, and answer. Like, in more, like more critical thinking. Yeah. I, I only take in what I, what I want and what I need. Mm. I'm not a college uh, advocate. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not. Yeah, school of hard knocks. I, I, I think that you should find what you're passionate at and what your goal is and do everything to reach that goal and learn what you need to know specifically for that goal. And don't waste any time learning anything else. 
until you need to. You see what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't agree with just going to college with no idea what you're going to do and spend four years of your life. And you're Trying just like, oh, what do we, you know? And, and then at the end, you still don't know what you're going to do. You may have a degree in something you don't even care about. That's, I think it's pointless. It's it's pointless unless you know exactly what you want, like to be a doctor, or whatever the case. Yep. So for me, it's like I came the first time to build a gym and I failed. And to the, to everyone else, what I told you before, they just saw it that way. And like, of course you failed. Like, are you surprised? Like, it makes no sense. Like, it makes no sense. There's zero upside to what you're doing. But to me, I didn't want to say anything. And it was it was kind of like low key because. I didn't want anyone to, to, to copy my idea because I was so shocked that nobody thought of it before me. But like like Fight Club, the, the movie Fight Club, right? You see these guys that are just like normal, you know, th- they're lawyers and accountants and, and, and everyday people that have normal jobs. Everybody has alpha inside of them. Everybody has that, that, that DNA inside of them that wants to just, just beat the shit out of somebody or train hard or, or look like a badass or feel like a badass, right? And so that's what Fight Club was all about was to expose that inner alpha in people that they meet in these warehouses and beat the crap out of each other. Mm-hmm. But all I've heard my whole life is how fight gyms never make money because fighters aren't loyal. They don't pay. They move, they trade gyms, they, they do all this stuff. So everyone keeps building fight gyms and then they keep complaining about fight gyms not making money. So as I always think outside the box and I always think differently than everyone else, because if I think like everyone else, I'm just going to follow them and be in that percentile. And I want to be different, right? I want to be the only way you can be to come different is if you think different and you do different things. Um, it was an easy fix. You know, you just build a fight gym with a great curriculum and a great team and great credibility, but you open it for everyone mm-hmm. and you, and you literally create it for everyone. So you don't just allow people to come. that don't have experience. You cater to them. So my trainers at AK Thailand, they, they train, their number one goal is customer experience. Number one. Number two is what I hire them for. And that's every, every staff at AK Thailand, 47 staff, all of them. And so when people come to AK Thailand, which is why we're the highest rated gym in the world, their, their number one goal is to make you happy. So if you come because you want to lose weight, that's the goal. If your kick isn't perfect or it's not, you know, the technique is not right, I don't care. I don't care. Mm-hmm. You're not trying to be Olympian champion. Mm-hmm. No other trainer does that. No, no, no other trainer in Thailand will allow you to get away with doing a bad leg kick or a bad technique. Uh, if your goal is to have fun, have fun. If your goal is to, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, understand your customer. N- know what your customer wants and then give that to them. And if they leave with a smile, you do your job. And no one ever thought about doing that. And that aligns back to exactly what you were saying probably five, ten minutes ago of your vision. Find something that you want to do and focus on that purely. Well, that's why all the things that went against what I was doing worked for me. People didn't realize that. You just got to think it from a different perspective. So building Muay Thai Gym in Thailand uh, when it's the most per capita in the world, okay, it doesn't make sense. Uh, you know, the whole economy thing and the whole, all, all this stuff, building a gym for, for, for people that aren't even in that country. Building a gym that that your clientele base is, is demographic is not even Thai people. Like they, they, nothing makes sense. Right. Mm-hmm. But the point was my intention was to build the gym, the best in the world ever. When did this idea start and when did it, the, the gym doors initially open and that come to fruition? It just came to fruition. The more I, I saw these opportunities and, and these things that I'm about to tell you right now started making sense, how I could put this together and make it into like a, a winning formula. So the, the low economy helps me because the, the, Training in Thailand is around three times the cost of America. Like three, yes. Because you can't get Muay Thai fighters out of Thailand very easy. It's very, very hard to get visas. So to have a world like 13, 14, 15 Muay Thai champions training you is, a, is, is, is very rare. It's very hard. So, so you, it costs you a lot of money. So I can charge three times the price of an American gym and pay 10 to 15% of the cost in my expenses. Mm-hmm. So now my margin's very high. So that's working in my favor yeah very lucrative and also my clientele are higher level where as far as like they're more uh appreciative they're more you know people that people that have more money and spend more money and have a a good experience tend to be more fun to hang out with they leave good reviews they enjoy themselves more they're not miserable they're not the focus the focus isn't budgeting and saving the focus is on a personal game yeah they're having so it's imagine disneyland for fighting yeah no one's ever thought of it but, but I, I did, and because of that, it became one of the highest gyms in the world. And, and so it's, it's, it's yeah, in, in the beginning, though, you know, I, coming here, everyone assumed, and that's, I guess, what I wanted. Um, since I'm a UFC fighter, I want to have the fight gym, you know. But that's never been my passion. You know, just because I'm a fighter in the UFC, 
wasn't my passion. My passion was to make something of myself and be successful. That was just the avenue I had to take. But, but as far as passion, I, I didn't want to – I love watching fighters fight. I'm a huge fan. And we have, a, we have a contingency of fighters. We are a fight gym. But it's like 80-20. Mm. It's not 50-50 or even 80-20 fighters because it never works. You never make money, and it's never successful, right? But the fighters that we do have, it's very hard to get on our fight team. So we're very stringent because we don't need to have any of the sponsored fighters. We don't need 50 fighters yeah. to sell our gym. Half yeah. the people at our gym don't even know half the UFC roster if they walked by. It doesn't matter to me. I, like, like a certain UFC fighter called me that's very famous who fought uh, John Jones. And, and he was, uh, or he messed me on Instagram. And he was like, not too long ago, actually. And he's like, what can you do for me? I want to come train at your gym. I hear it's the best gym. And uh, I'm coming with this other person, whatever, what can you do for me? And I'm like, what do you mean? I'm you know, take care of you, VIP, free training. We have a restaurant, free food. I'll take you out on the boat. We'll do some cool, fun stuff. He said, no, no, I mean, like, we take care of my house, my, my motorbike, and all this stuff. I'm like, I don't do that. I don't, I don't pay people to train in my gym. It's yeah. like, that's not what we do. We don't, need, we don't need people to bring people to our gym. The gym is, is the celebrity itself. It is the it factor. It is the reason people come. Yeah, it's not your target target audience isn't again. You're not building like you're. Not, you're are, would you? And I, I don't know if I'm crossing the line there. You're not looking to build a, a gym where fighters are coming out as champions. This is not the. Yeah, goal. we are. We are, but but we but but not at the not at the 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 level of other gyms where the entire gym is dedicated to that. Like so, for example, we I, put I, everything we have into our fighters that, that that are there, but it's a small group. And it's the best group in Phuket. If you look at our reels on Instagram, like to be, every other gym laughs at us because we're like the tourist gym. We're, we're the ones, of course, we're packed. So they can't laugh too hard. But, but we're, we're the tourist gym that's goofing around, having fun with our guests, doing stupid stuff. Our trainers are making faces and doing all this stuff. But it's like when you look at our five videos, we're beating everyone. Like all, all of our fighters at our gym, they're fighting, they're not fighting two-two drivers. They're fighting other foreigners from other gyms. And we're winning like 90% of the, like, to, like ninety percent of the time, we're winning the fights. Where, where are those fights taking place? Are, uh, are Rawai some- Stadium? Oh, yeah, yeah, Bangalore Stadium yeah. starting back now. So we're winning a lot of the fights, and and so we have a the curriculum is the best curriculum, aka, but it's just for a select group of people mm-hmm. because we want people that are not not most of, most of fighters that come to Thailand and train they're not real fighters, and and a lot of fighters that train everywhere aren't real fighters. They talk like they're real fighters, and they say they're going to be real fighters. But then they're in the clubs partying. They're doing this. They're doing that. They're not. They don't. They're not real fighters. You know. They don't understand what it takes to be a fighter. The dedication. So our guys at our gym are are the mellow, easygoing. They get along with everyone. They help everyone. They're nice. Manel Cap, for example, he's fighting the UFC Singapore. He's coming back in in, uh, in the next week or two. I, I don't know exactly. And I'll be co- uh, coaching him for the fight, and then I'll corner him in Singapore. So you'll go to Singapore? Yeah, for sure, absolutely. Yeah, we are looking, oh, another absolutely. guy, we are looking to go, and oh, it's sold out already. There's just We, no we have the best fighters, but yeah. there's, we have a small contingency of them. And so it's just more like we, we select very selectively because everybody comes to my office, like in the old days. They'd come to my office and swear up and down they're going to be the next UFC champion. And then I would, next thing you know, I'm paying for their, their, their housing because they run out of money. Or I'm buying them food because they were not a food because I feel bad for them, and then they just leave. Yeah, this has happened so many times. Well, yeah, I, I get it. That that time, and, I, and I wasn't even trying to be a fight gym. I can imagine the people that's trying to be a fight gym and take care of their fighters. I knew better than to do it, and was still falling into the trap, and and still getting you know that that situation. So it's like for me, it's like I'd rather have the best fighters and just have an overall good experience. I mean, to me, it's like success is not only just when a fighter wins a fight. A success is like when, when someone loses 20 kilos and they're happy and they're almost in tears telling me at, at the gym or they're having the time of their life. It's on their bucket list to come to AK time. They've been watching Instagram for like two years and they finally made it or, or they, they wanted to just have a fight in Thailand in the Muay Thai stadium and they're not, you know, professional amateur. They're not trying to be a fighter and they came and they had a fight like that to me is just as cool as if Manel wins his fight in the UFC. Yeah, and it's it's like if someone like myself would probably fit into like say your tar- target customer, someone that's you know comfortable and 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 just looking for maybe a goal, whether it's to lose weight, maybe to improve on a certain skill. But again, they're they're coming there 
without any, you know, burdens of can I afford my housing, my food? They're there strictly to focus on, on something in particular. Yeah. How many uh, of your fighters that, that come, someone similar to, like myself, come in and say, I'm here, I haven't trained Muay Thai, but I would like to do a, a fight at Rawai Stadium? Yeah, they do. And, and then the trainers train them. But, but we match them equally. Correct. With yeah. somebody from another gym who's also Yeah, and in your, in your gyms know because you need that relationship. I mean, you're not going to, uh, you know. Yeah. I, I've, see, I've seen it happen. So there's, uh, there's not a lot of options up here. I've trained at Sutai because it's at the corner. Uh, I've trained uh, uh, Sukar, Sur, 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 Sur Kit up the road. Um, and when I train there, like I've, especially specifically at this gym, um, there was a, an Australian guy just jacked. He's on the juice and he's a big boy. And but he, they're intimidating. He wasn't. In, so I went to his fight. This guy must have been yeah. 200 pounds ripped. And they put him against a Muay Thai fighter that was equal height, but probably 170. And I'm like, this guy's going to get his fucking head kicked yeah. in. Yeah. And he went in and he, he did some boxing in Australia, you could tell. And he lost his Muay Thai stance. And immediately in the first round, you saw him go back to the boxing. So the right hand yeah, dropped. Right, I'm right. like, I'm looking from the crowd. I'm like, and the Thai guy is just bouncing. He's like, are you sure? Are yeah, you sure? Yeah, yeah. And he gave him a couple like fake high kicks, like telling him, put the fucking hand up. Yeah. Two seconds later, head kick right over the top. The guy was knocked out maybe in 45 seconds. Yeah. But the point of that story is like those gyms, they don't give a shit who they're pinning you against because they're going to get paid as well. Yeah. But I, I like to hear that, that I've thought about it doing a fight. My only concern is, I don't want to break this face yeah. <laughs> as well. Like, cause then I, and you know, it's, it's not a money issue, but it's a headache issue at the hospitals here. People need to understand that like hospitals in Thailand, if you don't have proper insurance are not cheap. Yeah. Like if you, if you were to break your nose or break an arm yeah. and you weren't properly insured, you're going to, you're going to pay an arm and a leg actually. Yeah. I've um, been in the hospital for months. And yeah. the thing is, is like, you also have to have a goal, right? So, People have a bad habit of chasing money and chasing fame. Okay, both of which, if you chase only, that's that you base all your decisions on money and fame, which I've never based any decision on. Um, you're going to get, if you're lucky enough to get to a point where you achieve enough money and enough fame to, to, to suffice yourself, you're a slave, right? I mean, how many famous people can go to the grocery store and live a normal life, right? That's not what I wanted. Right. So I knew at an early age I wanted freedom. I didn't care about nothing else. And, and so the life that I have right now is the exact life that I set up for myself. And the only way I could do it was through, or the best way to do it was through this avenue, build this gym in this location. Um, Phuket is a beautiful place to live. It's a low economy. Um, I can make a lot of money with my business. I can make people happy. Um, I can do everything that I wanted to do to set myself up to where I didn't have a boss, I don't owe anybody anything, and I can do as I want when I want, and that to me is the ultimate freedom. I, I know a lot of millionaires and billionaires that have tons and tons of money, but they live on a schedule from day to day, and it's like, it's just a train wreck. Mm. I couldn't live like that. Like, I can go to Indonesia next week if I want, or Dubai, and, and I tell you, tell you my gym manager, and is done. I'm done. I'm out. I think... Uh, uh to the business side of it, and anyone listening to this, like, if they wanted to go open a gym, whether it's Thailand, it could be anywhere. Um, that first step that you took to like making the business plan and coming to Thailand, like, did you have business partners, investors? How did you put that all together initially? Cause I'm assuming one day things clicked like anyone getting involved in their business and now you got to lay down the groundwork. Are you able to talk a little bit about that and, and what were some of the struggles you faced? What maybe what have you done differently and kind of tell the story of before you broke the ground? Yeah, kind of like, I mean, Elon Musk is like my my idol. I love Elon Musk, right? His, his fundamentals are, are, are what I base everything off of. Um, and he embraces failure. So when he has SpaceX, he crashed three rockets, you know, and, and, and he couldn't make new rockets fast enough to get them back out there when companies like NASA would wait years, you know, to, to, to do it again because they were so scared. But he understood the fact that when you wrecked or you had failure, that's when you learned what you did wrong. So he would take his failures and he'd learn from them. So for me, when I, I came to Thailand the first time, I failed miserably at building a gym. I lost six figures. I lost everything. I, I mean, I lost everything. This is the first time I came. And everybody thought it was a failure. Everyone thought I lost my mind and I got what I deserved, what everyone told me, which sucked because it did 
you know, I, 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 what happened was what everyone told me was going to happen, right? But to me, it's like, that was my college. If you want to say college, that was my college. That was your investment that in, was my, in your education. Oh, my God. Dude, I had a blueprint on what to do. I had a blueprint. I sat and studied every single detail of why that gym didn't work out and why, what I can do to make that gym better. And I, I just reversed it and came back 10 times stronger and started AK Thailand. And I just had to be committed, you know, like, like Elon again. So what I did was I came in and I didn't have enough liquid equity to build everything, to build everything I wanted. But I wanted the, only, the way uh, to get an investor in Thailand, you can't get a loan in Thailand um, as I could in America. So to get an investor for liquid cash to give me what I wanted to build my dream and to still maintain power, maintain control, not have a board, not have a chairman, not have people to, to answer to. And to, for all these things to work out, it was a difficult task of, of how I had to structure everything. Um, but I also had to show commitment and I had to show commitment in a big way. So the way I figured about doing that was to come and uh, seek out who I could that could possibly help me and then just show them that I was going full, full speed ahead. So I committed myself before I ever had a partner. Like I committed, I started the company, I started the gym. I was 100% full on without the ability to finish. So you've built it to, let's say, the concept of, it's, a, it's kind of similar to what I'm doing on, on, on I had my, a Muay Thai business. area. I would have had a Muay yeah. Thai area. But you took that business to, let's say, the, the 10% level. So you had something tangible to show the investors. Maybe more than that, but, 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 yeah. but, but yeah. to a level I couldn't finish. Yes. And, and I was hoping that that would show the commitment enough to get someone to believe in me along with my business plan. Yeah. And along with, and my business plan outlined my true plan, like how we could truly build what I actually built, not, not, not what everyone else thought I was doing, which was just copying every other gym around here. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I say I'm not in competition with them. I'm not saying that because I'm saying I'm so much better than everyone else. I'm saying it because we're on different wavelengths. Like, like these other gyms are building fighters. Their, their goal is to build fighters. You can look at their website for the last 20 years, 10 years, five years, every single post is about building fighters. Mm -hmm. That's their goal. That's not, never been my goal. You know, I, I did that for the first couple of years to just kind of seem like I was doing what everyone else was doing because I had to lay the foundation. I had to get good a foundation before I could build a credible gym. You had to have good reviews and you had to have good, you know, customer experience and service and stuff. And you wanted to have some kind of credibility to get the, the gym going. But I, uh, yeah, I, I just started and, and started building the gym. And, and then I used that with my business plan to get an investor in Blair, my business partner, who... Uh, saw that commitment and came on board and, and then bought, bought into my company and, and it allowed me to be able to build the, the gym. And what year was this around when, when uh, um, or, or if you can quickly explain, like your first, you said you came out here, it didn't work, it failed. What was that timeline? And that was and like when, 10, 2010-ish. 2010, 2010? Somewhere around there, like 10, 11, for, 12. For, let's call it phase two of Between AK. the time I was failing and, and starting AK Thailand, it was like to 2012 or 13. I think I started 2012 or 13 AK Thailand. Okay, so, so before that, I was kind of failing. Yeah, ten years now, and you, you've had multiple. No, ten years. Yeah, you've had two facilities. The new, I've seen the the, the newest. Now, did you move locations or did you just renovate? No, no, we didn't even build the first time. We we never made it to the building stage. Oh, okay. We had the we had the building plans. We had the the lease rented for thirty years. Well, <laughs> we, I mean, no, I I noticed about, uh, you know, it's hard in Thailand. Time just blurs together it must have been six months to a year ago where you released a lot of content you put a basketball court you have the the yeah. ice bath this is all newly renovated isn't yeah, yeah yeah we're okay. always renovating yeah. so before that um was there any other location or was it always at the same location it's always been the same and, and then we're you still just, not developed yeah and you still keep renovating okay we're still, yeah what we're building next is going to blow the doors off everything so what we're building next is what's going to be what's going to set this gym apart from every gym in the world even though it's already unique there's no other gym in the world that's a uh, sports luxury combat training facility f of this size built for everyone, not just fighters. Um, but what we're building next is a, what I call a Cadi, AK Thailand exclusive. And it's uh, like a celebrity center and it's mm. going to be ex exclusive. So the entire facility is uh, it's a three-story building. Uh, it takes up almost a third of the property on the north end. Um, Still on the same location. Same location, okay. same location. Yeah, but it's going to be divided. And this is going to be like the supreme Louis Vuitton version of AK Thailand. I mean, it's going to be like the penthouse. How did this idea come together? Because just hanging out with so many rich people, Dan and all these guys, it's like I see what they spend money on. And like if you build it, they'll, they'll spend money on it. And so there's penthouses and hotels. There's, there's you know, nice boats and stuff like this, right? They, they'll, 
they'll spend money on things they don't even use. I mean, they'll, they'll get hotel rooms that have pianos and, and bowling alleys and basketball courts and not even use them, right? Pay 5000 a night. But there's never been a sports combat facility, like an entire three-story, state-of-the-art luxury facility with ocean view, mountain view, uh, gym view, that's 100% for that specific person and their party. So it's like the penthouse yeah. of sports combat gyms. So for like your, your ultimate celebrities, like your DJs that come to spin an illusion, like Aoki, guys that train, like Khalifa and, and Aoki. Uh, Bill Zarian, of course, my friend. He's, he'll, he'll be there for sure. Um, and so it's going to be for the elite of the elite. And that's because they, they still they need to maintain some sort of privacy because I'm, I'm how does that work when you do get it's, the celebrities there like in terms of they're in the gym are they getting are you able to to control the gym from maybe invading their privacy yeah they're good you know the thing is we time when they come and we don't announce it so dan gets the most attention he, he gets the most attention of anyone the guy's like of beyond course, yeah. famous I've, yeah. I've hung out with so many famous people here but like there's nobody like dan as far as from the internet, yeah, I saw some video of from him the, in Batong with, and it was just from the international crowd, every country, it doesn't matter. They know him. Like yeah. he, he's just like the guy. So he, he's the most, but like shock, it, shockingly enough, he's an introvert big time. So he doesn't like to go out. He doesn't go to clubs. He doesn't go out. He doesn't do things. So take him to Batong. You, you drag him out one time a trip, maybe. And yeah. he'll be here for like a month. But if he's in the gym and he's working out, are you getting your, your, uh, uh, other uh, clients are they, are they kind of Instagramming or do you control that a bit? They're cool. They're super cool. They just go, AK. okay. Yeah. At AK, we, we've established a family atmosphere. So for me, it's always been about family. It's always been about from the staff to the actual guest, everyone's treated like family. So for my staff, I won't hire somebody that's clock in, clock out. If that's your attitude and, and you're, you're that type of employee, you won't work for me no matter how good you are. It has to be a family atmosphere. So it's, it's if you can imagine like a, we're like a team, like AKA is a brand and every single employee is part of that brand. So when we succeed and we achieve something and we become, uh, we have celebrities come and that's exciting or we reach a goal or we do something special or we get featured somewhere, everybody's excited because they're all a part of it. And I want everybody to be a part of it. So it, it, it's, it's how I've built the company to be like a family and the guests are the same way. We treat them the same. So when people come in, they're just super respectful. They'll ask Dan for pictures, but they'll be very, very respectful. Yeah, not in, in Patong. If you saw that video, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, I, was, I have bruises Nightmare. on my back. Like pe we had one security guys, my security guards, the police guard. Like we had ten different security guards, and and it wasn't enough. Yeah, it was crazy. They didn't care, yeah, but at AK time, they're really respectful. Yeah. When you when you talk to Dan about that, and I saw he was on your podcast because uh, he had a recent book and he was on Nelk. I'm not sure if he did. Impulsive. The, I was in a jacuzzi with Dan on my roof. Yeah, I saw that. I saw you started. Uh, I started. I, I watched that podcast where you started in the ice. Yeah, and I, I've done ice baths, but you guys, idea. you guys are on another level. That's insane. It's like, his. Like, he does it every day. But you guys, that must. What's it? Negative ten or? I don't know. Like I, I've He's done. Crazy. I've done. You know, they have it at Fresca or whatever in Rawai. These yeah. like, that's what you guys are doing is next fucking yeah. level. Yeah, he does it every single day. So I built the ice bath at AK Thailand. I wanted to build like the best ice ice bath. Every, everything I do, I want to do the best of. And people's like, uh, you know, who cares about an ice bath? It's an ice bath. But to me, it's like, you know, it's like if I build something and people like it, it's like art for me. It's like uh, like the gym, the whole gym. I designed the whole thing. You know, the, 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 I drew the whole thing. I sat with the architects. We, I was there for every day of construction. So for me, it's like art. It's, it's like my pieces when I walk through there. And so when people get excited about the ice bath and they take pictures and Dan made a post on his timeline just of the ice bath itself, that makes me feel good. Because it's a fucking ice bath. It, it's not nothing special. Mm -hmm. But if you put that attention to detail, it means something to people. You know, you add the, the proper tiling and the, the proper paint, the, the proper design and the landscaping, you can make it something, right? So that's how Akati's going to be too. It's going to be just, just completely well, you, detailed. Do you currently have like saunas or hot saunas? We don't, no. Are you, are you planning? It will be, yeah. Yeah. And what's the end goal? Because I understood that your, your personal goal at the end of the day is freedom. Right, yep. if that's fair to say, it's one hundred percent. So, with freedom in mind, you're still running a business, but the business, like I think it's Gary Vee, these guys say, is as long as you're doing what you love, you're not really working, anyways. Right? Do you feel that way? Yeah, because well? you chase passion. Yeah. Because if you chase passion, then you're you're doing what you want. So, so when I say I, I'm I, I chase freedom, I'll sacrifice freedom if I have to. If a system gets broke and there's a problem, I will give up freedom to go back and fix that problem or work, do whatever I need to do. And while I'm having this freedom, whatever you want to call it, 
I'm working 24 seven. I never stop working. What does it feel like work? To it you? doesn't. But my phone is in my hand 24 seven. Indonesia, waterfalls, Dubai. It does, my phone is in my hand 24 seven. And I'm answering Aunt Charlie, I'm answering my media department. I look at every single video that goes out on our Instagram, every single post to make sure and improve it, to make sure it, it matches the, the criteria, the system that, that we set in place. Um, I'm, I'm just really OCD about that. Is there an angle where the phone turns off and you say, "Never." For, it, it, could you would you now? My, I, my, I can my, never do that. I, father, I hear people that talk about like, "Oh, you know, yeah. we, we want to retreat and we take our phone and we turn it off for two days." I could never do it. Why is that? I just can't. Mm. I can't. There's always some reason I want to be in, involved, and and the thing is, I built the system so that I can control them from my phone. So to me, if I'm like having fun with my girlfriend and we're in, in a location that's a vacation spot. And I'm on my phone. It's not the same. It's not being there at all. You know what I mean? It's still vacation. How, how do you deal with your team? Are you using Discord for your team now? Or are you using uh, WhatsApp? Or? We just built a Discord for AK for our, our community. Yeah, I, I, I'm start, so I, I, I work in China, actually. My real business, this isn't it. This is actually a creative outlet because my real business is yeah. electronics manufacturing. Oh, cool. In I lived there for six years. And uh, we all work through WeChat and I'm slowly bringing them over to Discord because of the way that you, and this is, we, we don't go too much into NFTs, otherwise this will turn into that. Yeah. But um, yeah, purely to be able to, to organize the, the communication. Otherwise, I'm at, you know, when you have a, like a line group or a WhatsApp yeah. group and it's just AKA WhatsApp group and you got 40 people in there, it's a, it'd be a nightmare. I'm disconnected from that. So, yeah. so we have a Discord that we're building now to, for the community, and we're also going to do NFTs. So that will be included eventually. Like an AKA NFT. We're going to do AKA NFTs. Are yeah. you allowed to talk about that a bit? Yeah, sure. Plan? I mean, yeah. I have uh, uh, Scrazy One, which is one of the best designers in the, in the NFT space, that's going to do our NFTs. And what we'll do is they're going to be macaque monkey NFTs, and they look crazy. They're, they're insane. Like from uh, your, your podcast real quick with Mike Swick, that monkey? Kind that, of. That kind of up? similar, yeah. yeah. And, and, and what they're going to be is uh, there's going to be just a lot more percentage of actual special monkeys where you get a membership. So you're going to have lifetime membership monkeys. Yeah. You're going to have like one month membership m monkeys, one year uh, membership monkeys. So you can unlock all these different things when you buy one. Um, and you can trade them because they're going to have the real shirts that we have. They're going to look like the, the, the people that trained at our gym. So they're going to be cool. So we're doing the Discord for that as well, but also just to build a community. The, what do you think that would launch or, or mint, let's say? I want to get started on it now, but um, it's crazy. It's already started uh, with the design, um, but then we paused and uh, he got busy with other stuff. And then I've been with Boxing Boys and yeah, it's just, it's, it's so much work. Will that all end up connecting in terms of utility, like collabing Boxing Boys with Absolutely. AK? Yeah. Bo Boxing Boys, like, like people that doubt what we're doing, like, it's going to collab with everything. Okay, so let, let's because uh, we can clip that later. It'll be nice. <laughs> let, let's yeah. uh, let's just jump into boxing boys. Um, how did that all come together? Because I'm in the same situation. It's one day when you find NFTs, there's no turning back, and your life's over. Yeah. How, how did how did NFTs and specifically this project of boxing boys come to you? I'm like a poker player, and and I've always understood that like you have to you have to risk to 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 get something in life like you can't just just get it for free you have to always risk something um for success and so um i'm not afraid to, to go all in i'm not afraid to push in if i believe in something and i learned about nfts and i had no earthly idea i think the the first time i heard about them was with jake paul so you're, this is one of his first fights it's got to be like mid 2000 it was, it was one of his first fights when he was like talking about nfts and stuff like that and they're going to yeah. do stuff and i'm just what the hell is an nft made no sense to me i did the whole thing like everybody else for like a week or so where i'm just like what are they, what how crazy is this what what is this you know and then it just dawned on me how big it's going to be and it was at the forefront it was the beginning it was like literally right at the beginning so i had to get in and i didn't want to get in as like an influencer or like a promoter i wanted to get in like as an owner like I wanted to be a part of it. I wanted to, to fully immerse myself into it. And so I found Boxing Boys and, and it fit perfect. And I knew that was something I could, I could add value to and we could build something great. And so I just jumped in. And, and what is it about? On. What is your, your roadmap? It's, I understand it's like play to earn, but can you speak a little bit about when did you guys mint? What have you done and what's planned for you guys next? Yeah, we had our first mint on December 26th and we minted at a tough time actually. We minted 5,000 NFTs. What we did was we had 10,000 and 
right before we minted uh, December, were, January, maybe December twenty sixth. Yeah. We we had uh, we were finding out there were a lot of paper hands and there were a lot of uh, the NFTs going to the wrong people. We wanted the NFTs to go to gamers uh-huh. and to go to people who's actually going to use them. So we decided to divide our 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 collection into two and have a series one and series two. And so on December twenty sixth, we did a series one five thousand and we sold out in two days five thousand NFTs at around 0.25 ETH, which was about two point two twelve hundred dollars at yeah. that time. And when ETH was, yeah, ETH was high, ETH, yeah. yeah, and ETH is fucked up right So now. imagine $1,200 a piece, yeah. 5,000 5, NFTs in two days. Yeah. That was a pretty big success for us. As, as, as yeah, yeah. And we were the first, like, sports combat NFTs, especially of that level, and still to this day, that's had that much success and sold out and have, has been kind of trailblazing ever since. Um, and so we're also building a game, and we're doing a bunch of stuff. We're doing staking. Staking is going live this month where you can actually stake your NFT and make money. It's yeah. passive income just well, you, by, well, just you by staking Will you have a coin with it as well? Is that and we have a boy's coin, yeah. Okay, so then that allows the staking to grow. And, mm-hmm. and then that's And we're secured all... on Binance too. Binance is one of the hardest places Did ever. Did you get the NFT yeah. You got the NFT We got the on IGO Binance. on Binance, oh, and, and we're working to get uh, everything on Binance. Yeah. So people can purchase the NFT and store it directly on their exchange. Well, 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 right now, they, right now we have the IGO locked. Gotcha. We're gonna do our IGO yep. on uh, on Binance, uh, which is incredible. And we're pretty much we're working with Q Globe, so we're pretty much, I think, in my opinion, gonna do everything with Binance. Yeah, and, and the paper. And, and, and if anyone knows, that's the hardest. That's the of hardest course. place to get. There, there's been 16 projects, NFT projects on Binance. Every single one sold out. Yeah. So. Well, because you're making it more accessible to the masses, and the biggest problem they have a now huge community, is huge, huge, huge. These, I'm sure groups. if you've you've purchased NFTs as I have, yeah. and through I'm you you use Ledger now, or did you move? Yeah. On? Okay. Yeah. Because I was using Nano S. So I'll, I I got the Nano X now. Have Have you tried the Nano X? I got the Nano S. Yeah, the Nano. Get the Nano X. It's yeah. nothing different in technology. It holds a bit more, but I'll show you mine downstairs. Yeah, Wait till yeah, you touch sure. it. It's like. And I have the Nano S. It's day and night. Because the Nano S is from 2015. Right, right. It's older, yeah. But, um, um, yeah, when I first got an NFT, so, again, I got the in-betweeners. I got 120. I didn't know about Ledger, so I had 120 on my wow. MetaMask. I didn't sleep for three weeks because I, I was so – I had one buddy here get hacked for three oh, NFTs. Tell me you didn't lose him. Oh, he lost three. He lost about 12 grand. Oh. But it was his own fault. It was a phishing scam. Whether he won't admit it, 100%, I know he's clicked something. But my point was, I didn't realize like how complicated Web 3.0, even today, it's not easy. Like if, if you don't know how to connect the ledger to a MetaMask to make a purchase to sign, to even set up your MetaMask to access your ECR20 token. I mean, this is, I'm literally talking Chinese to probably 99% of the people right now. Um, when you jumped into NFTs and outside of boxing boys, what projects were you getting involved in? Cause I did all see you them. post, I saw you posting your all shit all the time. I think I'm negative like $45,000 right now. Yeah, in so NFTs. That's, yeah. That's, that's the, my, my, from, from, from floor value to, to what I have, I think I'm like negative 45,000. Yeah, my, my thing is I would only get yeah. involved in projects with people that are doxxed and, and this could probably go to any of your paper hands out there. I mean, my I ex- learned, I learned, you know, but it, but to me, it's like, I knew. Uh, like like these people like they complain and they get upset when they lose money or the the value goes down but it's like it's written everywhere yeah there's 95 percent fail rate and it's one of the riskiest things so i always got nfts that i uh, i liked and, and i wanted to get the, the 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 first ones so the first major ones that came out i, I bought one of each because i wanted to have that first collection which so ones even, well, a lot of them there's so many i got like the prime apes and the crypto bulls and the you know, I just got Meta Eagles with with uh, Gal Yosef. I got about like seven of those, which that didn't work so well for me. Um, but uh, a lot of them, like uh, Angry Apes or something like that, you know, they failed and and stuff like that. But to me, it's like those first few. They'll never be those first few. Mm-hmm. So to me, it's like I'll keep them anyway. I don't care. But now there's so many, it's oversaturated. Now it's not worth buying anymore. So now it's like I look really strongly in the utility, and then what backs the utility. Is it yeah. real people? Do I see a real face and a real name, Correct. or do I see a, a picture of a monkey and a, and a nickname? Yes. I'm not. I'm not going to trust a monkey and a n- nickname. You know what I mean? So, so if I see good utilities and I see a good backbone, like uh, Atlantis, the Atlantis, uh, something Atlantis, we're about to buy here on Friday. Um, it's a it's a profile pick NFT or it's it's uh, something Atlantis. It's super high te- uh, high uh, definition like design. Okay, but they have their own metaverse. And, and Meta, Facebook, already came out and gave them credit for the metaverse and said it was amazing. Mm. 
and their price is like point one. It's like super cheap on the it's white list. So we're on the white list. Yeah. Oh, perfect. So we're going to get three of those because just because they have a metaverse already. And when you buy an NFT, you get a piece of the metaverse. You get a block. So immediately you have utility. You got something. Yeah. So like, and for point one, it's like 300 bucks. Yeah. So I'm going to buy three of those for sure. Yeah, but, but I'm not. I'm not standing in line buying unless, every NFT anymore, for sure. Yeah, I, 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 I've <laughs> gone back to the boat where, unless you're minting, you're losing, because yeah. when you buy off the secondary, it's just you, people get too much FOMO. It goes down. It's gonna crash. I, I've, I would consider my an, uh, self an expert, like just in terms, like me and Hans, like we talk about this stuff 24 seven. Like I, I actually want to do nothing but NFTs now. I'm super addicted. Yeah. I was the same way. I was it's I not good. an addiction. It's, it's crazy. Every good. day I bought one. It's not good. It's crazy. Um, and always, you know, you're looking at your phone and you just got to realize like, fuck the floor. Don't worry. Because the reality is something like, even like boxing boys is, uh, and we discussed that before you're going to get that FUD in the discord, the negativity, but you got to let these projects be organic because once you release that utility, the price goes up because it's relative to the utility. So like you saying, you're doing like play to earn people and staking. I mean, that's real utility. That's and, and we released that news this week, you know, so like it brought the price to, it, it, when I came back and, and first um, we had like a lot of disgruntled people in the discord because we weren't going fast enough. Like anytime you have of crypto, course. when you invest in crypto, I'm holding crypto right now in my, my portfolio for November. A yeah. lot of it. So am I. Don't worry. Pretty much all of it. Don't worry. So I'll be honest right. with you. I'm, I'm like like six, 70% down, 60% down on some of my crypto right now. It is horrible. So but I'm going to hold. I'm not going to sell. You only lose I'll never you sell. sell. You don't lose yourself, right? Yeah. But, but, but with NFTs, that has to be done right away. They're pushy. Certain people. Not everyone, but certain people, right? But it's how thin the floor is. So for us, it was like we had an 0045 floor at one point, and people panicked. But it was only like 20 or 30 people yeah. out of 5,000. And there was only 200 for sell. Out of 5,000. That 4%. Means, that means there's 4,800 people that weren't even selling their NFT. I mean, that was so strong. Yeah. But it's like you said, it's not a right way of kind of like. That's what I said. The floor price is like yeah. in, in a world of NFTs where we're trying not to live in FUD. Yeah. The floor price on, on open seas, they need to change that to average. Yeah. And the thing about it is we're game based. So it doesn't matter to me. If we were an art based NFT, then we'd be in trouble. Because what could we possibly do? to bring back so much hype and excitement to raise that floor price. Yeah. But we're game based. So we're based on the game. When that game comes out and you have to have an NFT to play the game. I mean, tell me, tell me what's going to happen. How does that it, work? It definitely isn't going to go down. I promise you that. I, I understand. I'm starting to s s understand that play to earn is, is, is a, because you're not a profile pick NFT. You're a play to earn NFT. Yeah. And we're starting to, s I'm starting to see these NFTs. They're not all the same. Right. How does how to how do people actually earn like off boxing boys in the future? How does that work? And I'm more asking like generally. I don't I don't understand because I haven't looked into it. As a as a PVP as a player versus player, we're 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 setting this up like like I said I told you before the the podcast Twister. So was, I want it to be like Twister, where the go to game for people. Like I want it to be just like a, a viral game where anyone can box anybody. Like grandma can box grandson, and, and it doesn't matter. And they get paid? Is it well, by they can. coin? They can. But I wanted it to be a fun game where you can just box anyone you want because it's fun. So the, if the reactions are good on the, on the screen and the graphics and everything, it's fun to be able to box anyone without actually hurting them. And then what we're introducing is celebrities and fighters. So you can actually box real celebrities and real fighters, um, and you can either win chances or pay to pay to 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 get your chance to fight a real fighter or a real celebrity um and you can gamble at any time so we're setting it up to where you can gamble on uh, your own matches so me and you could box each yeah. other and put 500 dollars on it and, and then and, maybe and coins. it could be your coin that we're playing with. and boys coin yeah, the boys and, coin, and, yeah. And, but 500 dollars worth the boys coin yeah, yeah. and then i'll win it from you so i'll win something from beating you so you yeah. we can be prize fighters even yeah. if we've never fought a day in our life or we can or if they can they can gamble on our fight or if there's two celebrities fighting, mm. we could gamble on their fight. Or we can possibly, in the works, potentially gamble on real fights. I mean, we're, we're creating all kinds of things inside this Yeah, because I saw Max Holloway fought Khabib, the first fight in the metaverse. I can't remember who. I think Khabib actually won that one. Is, was that with, with yours, uh, box? Was that, or is that something? Complete? No, it's, it's you separate. Saw yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Separate, yeah I, saw. I mean, it's, we're still so, I think, I think we're, st we're still so early. I'm talking like, I well, think. Well, this is what people don't understand is like they're, they're getting impatient. But they don't understand that, like, it takes time. Like, I, I said this the other day in the Discord. I said, what, what games have came out? 
of, of any NFT project. And and of course, a couple people named a couple, right? That the game, but, they, but they're like Atari games. Yeah. But to create a real game, it takes time. Of course. We're working with with uh, Saponic. I mean, Jay, Jay Park, if you saw my Instagram, I'm, I'm hanging out with Jay Park, multi-billionaire, uh, one of the most famous guys in the world. He mentored Steve Jobs. I mean, Is I'm, this why you were in Dubai? You were in Dubai, right? I was in Dubai, yeah. What was that for? I was, I was working, uh, uh, meeting, uh, meeting people and, and okay. doing deals and stuff. Gotcha. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. Okay. So I was, I was talking to Jay Park and, and, and uh, my friend Tokir and uh, Slavi and some other people. So, um, but, but I mean, how many, I mean, it, 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 it takes time, you know, I mean, the, 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 but these guys are experts that we're dealing with. I mean, Jay Park is, he's one of the best in the world. I mean, the guy's a multi-billionaire. You know, he has 300 games under him. It's Saponic, he's a founder. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he's one of the, 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 the foremost experts on blockchain in the world, uh, one of two. Uh, he's mentor Steve Jobs. And they're all part of your, your, your team, I'm hanging out with this guy at 3 a.m. in the morning, you know, eating, yeah. eating food, you know, on my Instagram. So it's like, we're working, and we're working with the best of the best. So to do that, it takes time. And, the, and five months is not a lot of time to build what we're trying to build. Oh, this is all a new era. Yeah. If there was a ton of games being built around mm -hmm. us right now, then we'd feel like, oh, shit, we're getting left behind. There's none. There's, there's none coming out. And the, the futters, they need to understand that. And I, I get that. We're I'm ahead of everyone. I'm in projects like this, too, where, like, like, everyone says this. This is not my quote. Like, one day in NFT world is like a week. And yep. it's people crave for AMAs, crave for updates, crave for you know updated roadmaps but a lot of people in the discourse and the projects someone like yourself and i'm involved i'm involved in a dolce and gabbana project yep. literally we did the ama last sunday the floor held mint and they said the reveal it was two weeks whatever so it's this sunday they literally said the reveals this this is the utility let's do that Every day in the Discord, people are dropping the floor price, going, when's the yeah. reveal? It's yeah, like, that's crazy. what the fuck are you talking about? Like, the roadmap is there, and they said the reveal is Sunday. And they'll come out today and literally be like, yeah, but when's the reveal? It's like, go to the fucking announcements. It says Sunday. They're like, yeah, but when? It's like, and, they, and I, the, whole, the whole lingo is, I'll, I don't think I'll, I'll never write W-E-N. I just won't. Yeah. And I won't say good morning, fam. And I, I just won't. It's just not. Yeah, there. yeah. But that whole world, it's it's a bit uh, in, very impatient. But and you know what? It's, it's not as bad as the MMA community. So for me, it's like I'm used to it. Okay. I, I mean, I, I never got hated on, but it's like I've been around the MMA community and seen how, how, how they act towards fighters. So to me, it's like yeah, it's not too bad. They're not quite as bad as that. And so I'm as nice as I am. I sat down for four days and like just really hashed it out with everybody and, and, and got everybody on good terms and, and tried to, and what I realized was I'm learning too. You know, I'm, it's new for me. I got into this to get experience. This is why I did it. This wasn't my project. You know, I, I joined this project mm -hmm. to get experience and lend my business skills to a, to a project that, that had the experience and the development and the coding and the stuff that I didn't know. The, the tokenomics, the, you know, the, the rigging, all the, all this type of stuff, game development. So like I'm learning as well. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of uh, projecting the news that they're telling me. So if they're, if they're wrong, I'm wrong. It doesn't necessarily mean that I know everything. Uh, but what I found out uh, from my discord is that they just want transparency more than anything. Yes. So, so we're trying to like hide the bad news and only give them the good news which is the wrong and, way. and give them no news if there's no news. Instead of just telling them, we switched game developers because the game developer that we started with that promised us this couldn't, uh, you know, they couldn't fulfill their, 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 their obligations and do what we wanted. So we had to switch to a better one. And now we're switched to two. Now we have two different game developers. We have Otherverse doing the metaverse and we have Saponic doing the game development because one game developer can't do both to our, to our standard. So we, we divided it. So Otherverse is giving us our own, like, portal into our own boxing world little will area you make your own metaverse or where you live we are in? you'll make inside of the other verse and then you'll sell portal land well, we're gonna have our own uh boxing boys uh metaverse in other verse through okay. a portal got it and anybody can go in got it and, you, and we're gonna have the ability to rent suits as well so people can earn passive income that way as well by putting their suits for rent and then uh, people who can come in and, and now you play. can sell digital assets within that and, absolutely and then those become those and then we got collaborations and people, and people don't get that now imagine you're an early investor in boxing boys and i'm, I'm not shilling this this is just because i'm in the nft space i get it yeah. and now you can do airdrops to digital assets and those digital assets can be sold on the secondary or minted for newcomers but that's the utility and imagine you've sold golden gloves let's yeah. say and they're the best gloves and they have extra power but you've dropped them to all your holders but the value of that is 
0.5 ETH and then you sell that on the secondary. You literally just gave 0.5 ETH to your holders. Yep. And people don't understand that when you get into the like that digital aspect of, of the metaverse and Sandbox does this, they'll sell you a, a dragon or, a, you know, a yacht or a boat or land. It's all digital assets that don't mean anything today, but they will. And it's and this is the way of getting around the SEC of paying dividends. You yeah. do your and, and it's all and that's why it's gorgeous that it's deregulated. Um, but people don't foresee these utilities and how that value in that works. And it's like I was showing you downstairs when your floor doesn't have enough blue chip owners. It's just it's the it, that shows the experience of the holders in the chat that just they don't know yet. And it's just a matter of time, I think, personally. Yeah. And, and when they see when they start seeing what we're going to do once we get this live, and the celebrities we bring on and the, and the matches, I'm going to build a theater for Boxing Boys at AK Thailand. So it's so imagine all the celebrities that already come to AK Thailand, there's going to be more at the Akati build when I build Akati, and we're going to have a theater in there for Boxing Boys. Mm. So for sure they're going to box, right? We're going to get them into boxing Could matches. Could you do it live virtual? We're going to do all kinds of so, stuff. So I mean, like, so when they start seeing these celebrities doing Boxing Boys against each other in Akati, that's what I mean. That's going to just boost yeah. it even higher. And then all these people that, you know, that floor is not going to mean anything. It's going to just. Yeah, I mean, so if, if you have like uh, Javier visiting or Khabib, whoever's visiting and they're in the ring and they got their VR on and they're going at it, I mean, you're maybe you're live streaming the live plus people are watching from the virtual or uh, this is where I start to go crazy. It's the, the creativity possibilities in NFT are literally endless. And, endless. And, then, and that's what I love about this, especially being so close with Jay, the head of this entire thing, because we can do so much. And like, imagine having the opportunity as a fan to box like uh, uh, Pettis, for instance, who's one of our uh, custom NFTs. Yeah. You, you can actually fight Pettis and have a video of yourself fighting Pettis, but not really fighting him, but, but kind of fighting him. That's better than an autograph. That's better than a picture. You're, you're, yeah. You have three rounds or six rounds or however many rounds actually boxing Anthony Pettis, and he looks like Anthony Pettis. It's really Anthony Pettis on the other end of the screen mm. at his home, and you're able to box him. Yeah, and that's the utility. It's so incredible. then what you do is you do a raffle for that with your tokens, yeah. and if you, you win the anywhere. raffle, you sure. get to go. That's awesome. You can pay or you can win it or you can do whatever. Yeah. And absolutely. when you explain. Uh, and they make money. The the, the celebrity, the, 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 the we make people money. People come in, they gamble yeah, on everything. it. There's odds. Fuck. Yeah. And then, because have you seen all these like gambling web 3.0 websites opening sports? Yeah, something? a lot of them. Yeah. This is awesome. I mean, now there's no KYC. See, I'm completely DeFi. Like, I don't have an exchange. I don't tell you how I do it, maybe <laughs> off camera, but yeah, this yeah. way I'm only on my ledger. I don't have anything, yeah. never touches an exchange, ever. Never. Never. I have a way. I'll tell you how later. <laughs> I, yeah. But anyway. I spread it out, but I do like seeing seeing it on there. I, well, no, I, but plus I, I have to hold too. So. Yeah, but my, le my, my ledger, I have ledger live on my computer, so oh, I see okay. everything yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, uh, I don't know. Anyways. I, yeah, I, I totally understand. But um, before I say the wrong things, uh, <laughs> so uh, on the NFT side, yeah, I told you about the Beaver stuff. Uh, you should check that out. I think it will explode. The Dolce & Gabbana as well, but I'm only, again, only in things that are backed. Um, let's transition out of the NFTs. Otherwise, sure. this could be a fucking two-hour. Yeah, no problem. Literally, I could talk about that. Yeah, no like, problem. I only, half the people I hang out with now, like, unless you're talking about NFTs, I don't even want to hang out with you. Yeah, yeah. Because, like, I'll start talking to people and explaining things and like i've sold you can ask him i've been out to like a restaurant and like literally sold nfts at, at dinner where people sit down and i'm just looking at the my nfts and they're like what's that i'm like oh you want one eh i'm like yeah, i'll teach well, you people are losing faith right now because they're all crashing and nobody's selling out the problem this, this is where this is the the, the, oh, the beautiful blood in point the street baby where all the all the scammy and 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 and, and not good nft projects are going to be uh, washed away and now the real projects are going to come out yes, now now that now now the gyms are going to start showing it's just because bitcoins crash so this is the start i th i think I, I i can do technical analysis and i read the eth chart we're fine yeah sure a, we're no, we, if we go under 25 24 okay maybe burn the boats but again i'm a i'm a long-term holder so i'm in your same position like i got in around december november so again i'm down but people that's we're here to 10x we're not here to 2x. So I love that it's so volatile because we're down and to, I'm completely comfortable if we don't come back till Q4 2024. Fine. If that's the case. That's, it should be passive in any way. It should be using passive income for crypto anyway. Uh, I mean, technically. I'm, I'm also a, I'm a hold'em player. I won't play poker with money I can't lose. Exactly. Because if you're playing poker or anything, if you're gambling, we're gambling a little bit. If you're gambling with money that you can't lose, you will fucking lose every time. I guarantee you. Because then emotion comes in. 
and you make the wrong decisions and you, you, you're in the Ethereum and it's dropped down and you sell and then it goes back up and now you're just chasing that purple drag and it doesn't work. Yeah. Um, okay, let's, let's take a, sure, sure, sure. a sidetrack. So uh, you, you had a recent quote and you said, sometimes uh, you know, life gives you lemons and other times the lemon tree falls on your head. Yeah. Um, let's jump into that and maybe you can elaborate. Yeah, I, uh, well, I got the uh, Johnson Johnson vaccine in July of 2021. I think 21, I think I'm pretty sure. Um, and anyway, I got the Johnson Johnson vaccine. And uh, when I got the vaccine, the day after I got it, I had to get it because I wanted to see my mom and I didn't want to wait two weeks and all this kind of stuff. Um, the day after I got it, my lymph nodes swelled up, like literally all of them, like the next day, like the very next day. So I looked online and that was the symptom of the Johnson Johnson vaccine is swollen lymph nodes. So I didn't think nothing of it. It's like four months later, I'm thinking like, uh, you know, I'm looking online, it's like four to six weeks, something's going on here, start getting checked out. It took a month or two of them getting, putting me through every single test imaginable. And I luckily, I found out I had great health. I was, I was very, very healthy. I didn't have any other problems, um, but they couldn't figure out what it was. Did a biopsy with a small needle, showed no cancer. So they were still trying to figure it out. And then uh, it just became where there was nothing else but cancer left. And so they went back and they did the big needle and they found cancer. So it, it, it shifted. It was like a roller coaster ride for a couple months of like, is it serious cancer? Is it minor cancer? Is it localized? Is it uh, s spreadable? Is it in this, in the, in this uh, bone marrow and the blood? As it turns out, long story short, after just months of stressing over this and that and just being a complete roller coaster, uh, I got diagnosed with stage four leukemia. So it's about the worst diagnosis you could possibly get. Usually that's a timeline. So for a month, I was, uh, I was pretty much waiting to, for my last DNA scan results to come back and uh, to find out my timeline and uh, what my situation is going to be and you know, how long can I treat it until it takes over, even though I'm completely healthy, living a great life, having fun, no symptoms, not a single symptom of cancer. So it's blowing my mind. I'm even they're telling me I have stage four cancer, right? And as it turns out, it's uh, through the DNA test. I had, that's the only way that they could call it uh, uh, stage four is because of the DNA test. Um, and they only do that very rarely because a one in a million cell count, they found a very small, small, small cell of T cell uh, lymphobastic leukemia. So it is the best case scenario for uh, leukemia, stage four, but it's still not good to have stage four leukemia. So yeah. That was not good news to get at 42 years old, but I didn't think about it, and I just kept living, enjoying my life, and and just what can you do, right? You, you just do it, do what they tell you, and 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 don't let it get you down, and wh whatever happens, happens. And as it turns out, it's uh, it's not only treatable but very very curable, and so we're expecting uh, a full cure. We, my my scan came back in Bangkok this last week. Uh, there was barely any cancer in my entire body. I mean, they could barely see anything. So they think about two more sessions of five days each, and they think that's probably going to be enough. On uh, uh, for chemo, chemo, and um, people saw on your Instagram because you 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 took a bit of a hiatus just for for yourself personally, and people are probably wondering. Um, you, you went through what was your treatment initially? Because you you wrote you went down to what about a hundred and fifty pounds or worst, something? Worst month of my life. Yeah, because I, I when I found I had cancer, like I didn't want to die. And so I wanted to do every possible thing I could possibly do except kill myself to beat this. And all the research told me that I had to starve myself, let my body starve and start cleansing itself and then do the chemo, let the chemo come in. So that's the only thing in my body. So I starved myself for three straight days with nothing but water uh, and did my first chemo, starved myself again. Then I started plant-based only for the first time in my life. Uh, and then I starved myself the next day, plant-based only, and then starved myself the next day. So for the first, the first week, I ate like two days, and I lost like 40 pounds uh, between the chemo and, the, and starving myself. And, and you're not a vegetarian, I'm assuming? No, I hate vegetables. I mean, you're from yeah. Texas, right? So. It's okay now, like we're figuring it out. Yeah. But I put myself through just the worst, the harshest chemo, the, the starving myself, plant-based diet, like everything that, that possibly it said could help to kill cancer and to, to treat it. And as we saw in these last results, just last week, uh, he said it was remarkable uh, for one month of treatment. It's a remarkable difference of how much cancer got killed from the chemo. I mean, it's almost nothing left. Yeah. And where, where did it's you like, start? It's like specs. 
where, where did you start doing this research initially? Just kind of online and trying yep, to find something online. more integrative, like a different approach to it? Or? Online and to my friend who's a, who's been a nurse for like 20 years. Mm. And so he gave me some guidance. He, he knew a lot about holistic type healing. Mm-hmm. And so he pointed me in the right direction, what to study, what to look at, what to watch. Um, and I just went all in. Yeah, I, I felt I, like, I mean, I literally felt like death. Like, But to me, it was like, I, it was a fight of my life. It's like, if you're ever going to feel miserable, it's like, try to kill cancer. You know, mm-hmm. it's like, I'm going to starve to death or I'm going to kill cancer. Did you do the treatment here in the U.S.? I did it here. Okay. Yeah. Was it Bangkok or Phuket? Bangkok. In Bangkok. Um, yeah, because I, I left you a voice message about that. We had a guy, Dr. Thomas Lodi. He's an American. He's he's I, He's gone back now. Holistic, right? He's here, yeah. He's he, here in Phuket. He's yeah, a holistic he's, guy. Uh, it, integrative oncologist but right. he likes he doesn't like to say oncologist he'll he'll say i do integrative oncology mm. um have you met him before i talked to him on dm like we talked on instagram and that's it oh if you want his direct contact just ask yeah he told me to talk to him and i was going to wait for the test that i just got okay but now we know it's kind of like everything procedure. you just said is ex- i've had him on twice because he's he, the guy's a fucking genius man like yeah, he, yeah. he knows he can literally, I, I won't go into conspiracy theories about the vax and all that, but like off camera, what he tells me, like he cannot just explain it. He'll explain it scientifically what's going on. Like yeah. to, the mo- it down, right? to the molecular side. Yeah, he's, he's got a high IQ. This guy. Very high IQ. I mean, he, he's worked at a, a, a lot of places, but he basically said exactly what you did. He said, you need to water fast. You need to go raw vegan essentially. Mm-hmm. And, but his big thing that he'll promote is h- extreme high doses of vitamin C. Yeah. I was doing like those tabs, rocket tabs. Like, like oh no, he's talking like intervent, uh, intervenous. Yeah, I do those too. So if you. B12 and, 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 and. Yeah. So you're doing C. exactly what he would I did say. everything possible. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's a... Uh, he's and the unfortunate thing was, is like my, my girlfriend was there for the whole entire treatment, which it was driving me nuts. Like the can- the chemo was fine, the losing weight was fine, the not eating was fine. Like not- like I was, I felt strong. So I wasn't weak like you would expect, right? I wasn't in bed, weak and tired. I wanted to get out of the room, but I couldn't. And I was watching my body, to t- you know, just shrink. And-, and I couldn't work out because the catheter was in my bicep. So you can't do any workout with, without using your bicep. You so know? is it what it, when at that point? What are you losing? Are you losing water weight or actual muscle mass as well? I was losing everything. I mean, I was 151 pounds. I'm 190 right now. So like I was, I was low, and and so that was driving me absolutely insane. And then my girlfriend was in, in my room and she got a fever in the room with me. Now, mind you, I have low blood count. So if if she if, can't I, if I get sick, especially COVID, I'm dead yeah. I mean, possibly. And she had fever, and so she started getting treated in the room. Because we had a room, so we had a bed and then a hospital bed and a kit and all that stuff. So she was in the hospital bed, and they were giving her COVID tests and all that. She passed and all that. But as soon as she got home, she had COVID. Oh, so fun. we don't know, like, if it was extended or whatever the case. I never got it, thank God. But I had the last week by myself, which was the most miserable time because it's already been three weeks of being in this hospital. Everyone's speaking Thai. None of my family, none of my friends, only her. I didn't tell anybody. So it was like I was just completely lonely. And even though I starved myself, and made myself look how I looked. It's like it was demoralizing looking in the mirror at yourself so skinny and so depleted, and your hair starts finally falling out like at like uh, at, at third or fourth week mark, you know. And so it's like it was just like so depressing because it was just like even though it wasn't the cancer causing the, the 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 hair or the weight loss, it was just it was yeah it was it was a, it was a tough. Now, I'm assuming, this is probably the, the most tough week, difficult week of your life. It was a tough one. Because you have nothing to do for twenty four hours, you you do nothing like literally. And how you're supposed to sleep? And how how can you sleep for twenty four hours? Mm-hmm. And and you only walk to the to the bathroom into the into the bed. So when I walked after I got out of the hospital, I walked through the airport to get on my flight and come home, and I was sore for two days, my legs. Because you, yeah, you haven't. They were so yeah. sore because I walked that distance just just through the airport. It was what crazy. were you doing to kind of keep keep yourself sane essentially? Uh, just uh, movies, internet. It was it was a good time to like study business and like work on things that like for boxing boys and for AK and, and systems and like I was doing a lot of business stuff but it's like you know it's it's tough when you're depressed and your your, your mind's your, a bit your foggy mind's foggy yeah, yeah. You, you start learning but then you start thinking about stuff and you're not even all of a sudden you're not looking at what you're supposed to be looking at you're yeah. thinking about this you know so and I wasn't taking none of the stuff they were giving me and all the Zolofs and no. ant- benzos and stuff like I. I wasn't scared, so I didn't want to get addicted to benzos too. No, you no, know? fuck that. Yeah, and, and so then you're saying that next step is you'll get the 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 biopsy back, and then you'll no. Next step is two more chemos, two more chemos, and then another scan, and then another scan. 
Um, but by the looks of it, I mean, you're looking much healthier. You said you're up to yeah. 190 again, yeah. right? Yeah, I'm bigger than I was before I went to the hospital, yeah. And and you're feeling great now? Like, are you, are you training regularly? Yeah, every day. Um, okay, so let's... And, and that story, again, it's... Um, uh, watching Rogan and another Khalil, I think Khalil and Roundtree was just on Rogan last, but there's been like four episodes where I, I, I kind of watch it in the background when I'm cooking and it's, th they're nothing but talking about you on, on that show. Oh, did you I hear about know that, yeah. yeah, at least. Joe Rogan talking Joe, about my cancer? The, the past four, at least almost every other episode. That's crazy. You know. pe because it, he's bringing on the fighters and they bring you up. So I think uh, Bisbin was on and then they're, oh, did you hear about Mike? It's and, funny that like, I don't make news for so long. Like I build AK Thailand and get no news, but then when I die, almost they well, get, I get news. I, I think but, <laughs> you have but, to almost die to get news in the MMA world. But I world. think at the end of the day, everyone still knows you, who who you are because you are that pioneer coming through the Ultimate Fighter, and and I mean, obviously you agree. But you with build that. the largest gym in the world, you get nothing. Uh, you almost die. At the head of uh, you, the front page of every news, uh, you know, MMA news article. But I think I think everyone's still aware of what you're doing here. I yeah, just, of course. They of just course, don't need. Right. They're not gonna. It's not newsworthy. I get it. Yeah. It's it's yeah. Well, it's not that it's not newsworthy. It's like they know in the back of their mind. Like, okay, my dad's cutting the grass. <laughs> I don't want to do it that it, way. Yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. But it's um, just funny how how much yeah. it blew up because of. Yeah, everyone was talking about it. I think negative. they were more, and that's what I was saying to you today when you asked. Unbelievable what are support, by the way, to everybody that supported me. Like, did I, they all reach out to you? Oh, like the my Instagram and stuff. Like, it, it blew me away. Yeah. Yeah, I I, I thought everyone hated me. Like, no, I, I live a great life here, and, and, and I show up for inspiration. Yeah, I want to inspire people to be – because I was inspired by people when I was coming up. I love a small-town Texas boy. I lived in a trailer house at one time, right, like in Texas. And so for me, it's like I dreamed of having a life where I could do what I want and, and live how I want and not have to ask my mom or, or, or anybody or a boss or someone permission to do anything and, 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 and have freedom. And I never put I – ne I never – because the way I think, I never put uh, people on tears – like a doctor, like the doctors and the cancer doctors, they don't come in my room and they're not like ahead of me. We're, we're the same. You know what I'm saying? Like I don't put people ahead of me because of their position. And so I, I question things. I ask questions. I, I look up things. I, I don't take people for their word. They're, they're regular people just like anyone else that can make mistakes, right? And so the same thing with like uh, barriers and stuff. So it's like I knew I, I couldn't get what I wanted in America, so I moved to Thailand. So like I, I don't put any kind of like barrier on what I can do. Like, I feel like this world is open for all of us. We're all equal. And yeah, we're all equal. We should, if, if, if what we want to achieve in life is freedom and a beautiful place and have a great life and, and have this, that, and the other, and it happens to not be in America, then don't be in America. Don't live there, you know? So, so it's like, yeah, I just, I assume people see my life now and, and a lot of people think I'm lucky and most people are inspired, but there's always those couple of people that are like, oh, you're an asshole and you're, 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 you're show yeah, off and all this kind of stuff. But it's like for inspiration and it's like, it's my Instagram. Don't follow me. It's my life. And it's like, I hope that you can do the same because like, I, I wish I could convince people to chase freedom instead of slaving away, chasing money and chasing fame. So many people chase fame. They're in Hollywood chasing fame every day to get famous so that they have to stay at home all day. Do you know what I mean? Well, I think that's because it's fame's changed a little bit over the past since social media. It's, it's also because uh, fame likes whatever engagement is a currency. Um, Khalil, I, Khalil Roundtree said this perfectly the other day. He said that you need to understand that the more followers I get, when I get sponsors, the more money I get. So actually, social media and engagement is my currency because he said this fighting at the end of the day, I can't do that forever and it's not going to pay the bills and I need to start thinking how to pivot now. And a lot of these people on the social side, and he's not over the top on it, it's I need to create those sponsors, those brands, so I can get into business with them and this is just the reality. Um, so on your side, you're talking about freedom and, and, and you're going to be doing this luxury aspect at AKA. When you set goals and that would be the next goal, when those close, those goals, do you have a few that are planned in the future or do you kind of, what is your process as you progress towards those goals and creating new ones? I don't need to do anything else. So, I mean, I can live in freedom how, how I want from here on but and, and still work at AK and do my stuff at AK Thailand or whatever. But I will always tackle new endeavors that I have time for if, I, if I'm passionate about it, like 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 the and Boxing Boys with NFTs, um, working with TR as an advisor. Yeah, I saw um, you know, th there's other things I'm working on th that's coming to fruition. Um, if I can still keep my freedom and still do it from anywhere and, and, and still add value and do my job and, and, and be successful at it, I'll do it. 
But if it's going to take away my freedom, I'm not, I, I don't need to. I don't want to. And, and 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 how I explain that freedom, or how I can prove that freedom is so important, is like look at Dan. I mean, Dan's one of the most famous people in the world. Dan Bilzerian's. You know, what I mean, he's, he goes everywhere. He can't walk anywhere. I mean, he's so famous. Why is he in Thailand more than any other country in the world? Because we're off diving in boats all day with nobody watching us. Yeah, we go diving every single day, and it's usually like five of us at the most. Every single day we're free diving. Yeah, shout out to Tony and and uh, yeah, off off uh, Racha. I mean, we're diving every day, and that he loves it. Mm-hmm. That's freedom. He comes to Thailand for freedom, and, and of course he likes the the diving, but he likes diving and weightlifting and all the different things that he does. But in, in the end, all of it is based on freedom. He doesn't get harassed. He doesn't have it's to the hide. privacy as well, and it's yeah. But I think Phuket's. I uh, I think we're. Uh, we're used to seeing this a lot of celebrities in Phuket. It's like you'll see them around at the at the the restaurants, the coffee shops. That, for me personally, like I just if I see them, I give them the space. I I, I would ne- you don't fanboy out, but if you saw them, if they walked through your hometown in Texas, or if they walked through L.A. or well maybe not L.A. but certain places in the U.S. like they can't go there. Like yeah. guys, guys like Justin Bieber, they can't live that that life. So yeah, I, I'm I would I would never wish for fame. Um, when you're choosing these projects that come to you, like the like Boxing Boys and AKA Thailand, I'm assuming now at your level, I mean, you got about 200,000 followers on Instagram. How often are you getting hit up with business opportunities and proposals? And how do you sift through those and what you're going to do? Because I would assume that might be a difficult task. It's more now, but the thing is, if people are hitting you up, usually they're below you. Does that make sense? I, if I someone hits me up on Instagram, they're usually not in a, in a position to hire hire me and something I want to do mm. or it's worth it to me. Yeah. And they're going to send me an email. And I gonna, think to reframe that so people me. don't look down on you in that, that response, it's more just, I don't like, mean don't do yeah, it. I'm yeah. just saying for me, from my experience, yeah. I get hit up with more spam on, on, on Instagram than I do of actual opportunities. They're more looking to get something than to collaborate in, in business. All deals, most, most big deals are done through connections and network. So it, it and as you learn from Dale Carnegie, if you ever read Dale Carnegie uh, and Napoleon, Hill, stuff like that, Dale Carnegie's, that's changed my life. I mean, how, how to influence people. I mean, if, if your influence on people is, is everything. If it, like Jay Park, for instance, he's a multi-billionaire. If he likes you as a person and, and you need help for some reason, he can help you with anything. He's a billionaire. He doesn't care about money. You see what I'm saying? He has that much power. Yeah. If he doesn't like you, he's not going to help you with anything. There's, and Dan, same way, uh, certain other people. So the power of influence, the power of, of what people think of you is so important. And so most big deals and, and, and deals that I take and deals that I'm involved with are brought to me through my network. Like, we're, like I can't think of one that, that wasn't. It never just pops up on like my, my Instagram. Like th- those are like influencer things or, or scammy things spam, or yeah, SEO. Yeah, yeah. Like no one serious ever hits me up on Instagram. Yeah, no, Instagram, it's too, it's too spammy in the back end. I, I understand that as well. But, I mean, yeah. usually they send word. And, you, and, and the funny thing is, is, is like they, they'll try to do it through me all the time to get Dan. Uh, Every okay. time Dan's in town, I get so much messages yeah. to, to reach Dan. Yeah, I've had, I had and, a few to get to when Juan was on the podcast. I had about yeah. 20 people message me. And Juan's, yeah. And Juan's, they wanted, my, Juan's my type brother. That dude is. Yeah, oh, he was on the podcast. I saw him at the, the event the other night. The. Uh, uh, Baba Loop. No, the I I I don't honestly I don't party much. Yeah. So I if I do go out, it's more like I'll do beers on the beach and maybe drink ten. Yeah, but I don't. I'm not clubbing. And it's just not my thing. But I saw one over at the Bangtao Muay Thai MMA Grand Opening over oh, there. Cool. But yeah, when I had one on, I must have had twenty people hit me up that were yeah. friends. They're like, yeah, I saw one was on. So can I get his WhatsApp? I'm like, no. Yeah. I'm like, I'm like, come on, guys. But um. Yeah, shout out to Tony. Tony uh, and Tony too. Tony, Tony brought on. I I have reached out to Tony Love because Tony. I I got into free diving the day I moved to Phuket in 2016, mm-hmm. and that was the first thing I did. I said if I'm gonna live here, I need to learn free diving. I got my Ida Ada A I D A level two. You probably do Tony's. It's a different one. It's it's a difficult name to pronounce. Yeah, I don't do it. At, um, the just Tony, to, Tony just 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 gets scared and grabs me every time I. How long did it like take you to? Uh, to get down to like uh so i got the lowest i got was 20 meters whatever what's that it's, it's way better if you talk to tony about this oh uh, but for you you just you just go for it yeah he, he tells a story him and dan love telling the story uh, about me like how i dive you're you're just the, uh, you don't get it ear ain't problems? The same. well uh, not now hmm. but i did 
But yeah, I, I'm I'm completely on regulation. <laughs> so you, you've I'm been, like a rogue diver. You don't. It's it's and people. But I'm getting a lot better at it now. Now I finally learned how to really uh, clear my ears without even using my body. Like just only using my jaw and my and my. Yeah, I haven't got that. I can do my nose. Yeah, I finally scuba, can do it now. Yeah. But I can't do the jaw yet. Um, but I'm so you're using the massive fins and and. You guys are primarily diving off like the off PP that area and what? Yeah, we're doing deep K. I mean, Dan Dan can go down sixty feet. That's insane. And he'll go down for two minutes. I'll go. I've done fifty five for a minute forty five is my longest. A minute forty five. Are you training single breath? Uh, are you training through Tony by just doing like uh, practicing breath holds? Oh yeah, Tony. Hel- don't, don't get me wrong. Tony helps me and yeah, he yeah. teaches me so much. I just haven't taken any official courses or anything. And, and no, no, well, you it, wouldn't need to, when I get back. excited. So when yeah. it comes to like, when we're actually in the, vin- like in the place and there's caves and there's, you know, and we're deciding whether we want to go or not. Like I'm, I'm always like, you have no fear. I, I, I really kind of don't. And I should. Hell. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I've passed, does... passed out like a couple of times. You've, you've blacked out. Yeah. And then someone's grabbed you or yeah. they were flash, flash pass outs. Tony like, was there, but, but it was, it was, it was, uh, doing challenges. So like, I had a reason it? to keep going. Were you doing I, it on we the were, line? We were or winning. No? no, we were doing a pool. It's Sri so uh, they, they have a 25 meter pool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I did 81 meters underwater. <laughs> I can't help. 81 meters. Fins or no fins? fins. Okay. I did 50. I did 50 meters with fins. I mean, without fins and 81 meters with fins. But uh, I had to beat 75. Mm. So all I had to do was push off, and I lost my breath at 50. So I was pretty much out of wind at 50. So I hit the the last 25 with just just. Were you getting the the shake? Oh, 100%. Yeah. I was dying. And yeah. then all I all I had focused on was I had to hit the wall and push off and I and cuz he hit the, the wall and went straight up. So as long as I hit not it was another guy, uh Nick. Um yeah. so as, as long as I hit the wall and pushed off, I I knew I I'd, I'd win. And I pushed off and I got to like 81 before I passed out and then it was like like a flash pass out, yeah. Yeah, it's it's dangerous. That's why like when they're they're training you, they say like, "Okay, if you're going to 20 meters, you when you go to 20 when you hit 10 your partner goes to the 10 and waits for you to go to the 20 i yeah. i hit 20 and it was uh i've never been back it's people it's no joke 20 meters so what's yeah. that 60 feet 60 feet yeah. okay i've hit that but i you have to hit that uh, i did it on a line but it's oh, line, yeah, yeah. it's literally like i was down and like panic up i might have done 60 on a line i don't know the longest line that i've done just but but free diving i did 55 and then that's you, and tough you, because like because free diving you got to go down so you got to use energy yeah and the whole point is conserving your energy because like your oxygen is being used yeah. so i was super proud of 55 at 145 but you're staying uh, down there too right 145 yeah that's crazy man that's that's too much i i, I think free diving it's 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 one of the best things to do while you're in phuket the only problem i have with it is um there's nowhere to go unless you go out on the boat so yeah. like i kind of have no, no no there is uh, uh you go to banana beach this one over here. When you got to take a boat from We Cafe. Oh, that ba- Banana Beach. But Banana Beach, yeah, you can yeah. actually, we uh, we went, well, you know, that same day we were talking about. Yeah, yeah. That's where we went and uh, and, and, and did that. Uh, but we went with uh, Dan and all the guys, and we went uh, off the shore and straight from the shore. Like, you got to be careful because of the urchins. So you got to start, like, uh, swimming before you can actually need to because you'll you step on the, the urchins. The yeah. black ball ones. Yeah. yeah. So, but you start swimming. It's, we saw the most sea life and the most beautiful, like, reefs, n- not just because of, but, like, literally, we saw urchins, snakes, uh, lionfish. Like, we mm. saw so much crazy stuff there. It, and, and then you keep going and you can do deep dives. So, have you been up to, have you have you done Samelian or Surin Islands? Nah. I've done Kotao all around here. And then I went with Dan to Maldives and we did with the Mantis and then, uh, Dubai, Dan did the pool. I think it would be far for you guys. I don't even. I don't even think Tony's been there, but I, I told him about it. So you know the Samelian Islands. Yeah, yeah. Okay, amazing. But it's scuba diving because you got to be on liveaboard. Oh and yeah. And it goes eighty k in the ocean, and yeah. then they have these rocks, but they're you, you got to be liveaboard. So yeah. there's that. But if you go to the Surin Islands, which is uh, from here, it's about a three hour drive. It's an hour north of Kalak. I mm-hmm. went with uh, an ex girlfriend a, a while back, maybe two three years ago. But they take you out on a speedboat. But again, if you guys are going on a boat, um, it is. It, have you been to the Philippines? I have been, but I haven't dived there. Okay, so it's but it's at that. It's like it's not Maldives level nice. up here, but it's it's very comparable. Yeah. So when you go Egypt, to the, I heard it's crazy too. 
I heard Egypt's the best for free diving in the for world. For the, the yeah. uh, sea life and stuff. But then you're getting now you're getting into cold water, and true. I'm a true, little true, bitch. True, so. true, true. <laughs> suits. That's why I love the water here is is great. Um, okay, so well, before we uh, before we wrap it up on, on that side, um, I wanted to kind of touch a little bit more on on your career, and this is more for anyone that is up and coming in MMA, and if you want to just. If you don't want to if, ask your dad who I am, he's going to brief you real fast. <laughs> it's, it's, if you were to, um, you know, be a spectator from the outside and kind of give uh, a summary of who was Mike Swick, uh, what was his UFC career, and what did that represent as a milestone in terms of the UFC uh, being what it is today? And putting ego aside, how would you define that? I don't know. Like, I was way better than I thought. Because I never thought I was, like, I won fights, and I did good. Like, my first five fights I won, became number one contender, dropped weight, became number one contender, welterweight. So you'd think that would be, but to me, I never thought, like, I was, like, that good at all. But I think your legend grows because, like, people that come to AK Thailand now, they, they act like I was, like, way better than I was. And I'm just, like, uh, when you were in your cr- you glad never- they forgot, like, all the bad times because, like. Did you ever... Did you ever realize at any point, like, what level you were at? Because at the end of the day, in that wel- uh, welterweight division, correct? I was in both. I was in light heavyweight on Ultimate Fighter, uh, 185. When you fought My Dan first fights in UFC, well- and, then, and then my welterweight. Okay. I fought all three weight classes. Okay, so when you fought... Uh, I tried to fight them all. When you, but you're, you're at that level of, of welterweight and getting yeah. there with Dan Hardy. I mean, there's still, in the entire UFC roster not not just today but of all time there's only a handful of people that have been to that level when you two times i was there so so i was yeah. i was fighting dan hardy to fight the yeah. winner fought for the championship or against gsp and then i fought yeah. david loazzo yeah. at middleweight and the winner fought anderson silva and i beat david loazzo and had a fight with anderson silva and i postponed it because i wanted to fight in texas mm. and it was the first time that the ufc of its size like the big ufc went to texas at the honda center whatever it was and I fought Yushin Okami, and I dropped the decision, and I lost my fight with Anderson Silva, which could have been a good thing because Anderson had, like, two fights in the UFC, but we didn't know, like, how His good level. he was, and he went on to, like, 17 wins in a row. Yeah. So, like, maybe that was a good thing, yeah, that one at least. Anderson at that, he's pr- – again, I don't believe in goats, but, I mean, he was the goat of that he era. Was, he, he's the goat to me of all time, you and think? the reason being – and Khabib's my teammate. Yeah. And Khabib's the, one of the greatest fighters of all time, but I think – Overall, Anderson's the GOAT, and the reason I say that is because he's the only person that was the was such a GOAT in his prime. No one beat him in his prime. 17-0. and 0. In, his prime, he was, in his prime, no one beat him. And every fight was shocking. Every, every fight was jump out of your seat. He never played yeah, it safe. The Forrest Griffin and fight was just... And he still won every fight. But when he would lose a fight, he would pick himself back up. When he got out of his prime, he still fought, and he would still win fights and still give his, his all. And then when he got way past his prime... He went into boxing and went into other fights and still kept fighting. So, like, that's the difference. We've never seen – nothing against Khabib. We've never seen him take a loss. How would he have came back? Yeah, the, it's the leg. That was like I so think to be an overall GOAT, you have to know what a fighter would do in every scenario. And Khabib was just so damn good, he never had the scenario of losing. So we, we never get to see if it affected him to where he would lose again or be insecure. You never know until you lose. But Khabib, I, I, I do uh, appreciate I'm confident he'd he, be fine. But uh, I'm confident he'd be fine, but it's also, he, he kind of, he doesn't need any more money. He lives a simple life. He's great. And, he's doing great. And every, but Father Time will show up one day, and does he need to take a head kick for no, it can happen, right? I it's, think he did perfect. I, I think I mean, I, I, I think he walked out like if he fought where Char- no one else is going to If he do. fights Charles Oliveira, come on, let's be honest. He fucking destroys him. It's just, it's not, so who else is there? There's, there's no interest. Does he go up a weight class? I don't think so. No, no one has the ability to walk away like he did. No, that's right. And, and to think that someone else can have the, the things that he has to walk away, not only is he dead set with his mindset and, and the reasons why he's walking away, that it's unchangeable, but plus he also has a life. He has money and he has no other person's going to have all those things together to quit. So it's like, I don't think anyone's ever going to fight uh, and, and retire undefeated again. No, and all those goats, let's say you're Mike Tyson's Muhammad Ali's uh, of their era, father time catches up, and then they start getting hit, and then you see what happens. So and it sucks, yeah. And it sucks. and it, so Even I, Anderson Silva, I feel bad for him when he loses, and he's still one of my greatest of all time, but I, I hate seeing him lose. Right? There, there's a certain point. I think Khabib made the right decision. It's not the best. Absolutely. Thing. 
Um, and, and just to jump back to that and we'll wrap it up from, from here, it's, it's more maybe a fanboy question when you, when you were at that level of, of welterweight, like mentally, did you know how good you were? Like, did that ever click? I had no doubt in my mind I could beat GSP. Now that's crazy to say. And yeah, I know people's probably like, but, but in my, in my camp, uh, we had John Fish that fought him and Koscheck, but I was the one that they wanted to fight the most. And the only reason, the only reason, none of us could beat him technically. He was the most technical welterweight. He's one of the most technical fighters of all time. We all knew that. But the difference being is I wouldn't put him on a pedestal and I wouldn't respect him and I would come after him full blazing like Matt Serra. So the same exact way Matt Serra beat him would be the way I would attempt to beat him. Would it work? We don't know. But it would be a way better chance than our other fighters and many other fighters who tried to outfight him. You can't outfight him. And I, I would know that I couldn't outfight him, but I wouldn't be afraid of him, and I wouldn't have put him on a tier where I couldn't beat him. I just wouldn't beat him at his game. I wouldn't go yeah. point for point. I wouldn't stay on the outside. I would go straight for the kill, and I wouldn't stop punching until the fight was over. So he would have to either land the knockout or I would land the knockout. And so I felt more confident in that fight than I did with Dan Hardy, mm. just because of the game plan. Why, and, why, with Dan, why not with Dan Hardy? Because Dan Hardy is one of the smartest, uh, most strategic brains in the, in, the, in the sport. 100% agree. And I knew he was. And I watched for the Dan Hardy fight, I watched more of my fights than I watched of his fights. Because I was trying to analyze how I would beat myself. Because I knew that's what Dan was doing. Mm. And of everything I thought of, he thought of the one thing I didn't. And that's the hook. When I was leaving myself open, for, when, I, when I'd lounge in, and I'd leave my hand down, and he'd catch me with the hook. He never knocked me down from the hook, but he caught me every single time. And it was enough to beat me. Yeah. So he, I knew I was fighting a, 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 like a genius level, like as far as a kinetic, human kinetic chess fighter. So that was a tough fight for me yeah. because I knew I had to, to have a perfect, perfect fight against him. Yeah, I mean, if you watch his breakdowns, and I saw you do podcasts with them, and that's interesting how uh, you fighters find that respect and come together yeah, years sure. later. But um, that's off to him. I have no problem. Yeah, he, he, what's, what's it called? The reptilian. I hated him at the time. Well, you have to, right? Because they put me in line to fight George St. Pierre. So, so, so they wanted me to fight George St. Pierre. And so they, they had me fight Martin Catman. And they wanted me to fight Martin Catman, hopefully win and fight George St. Pierre. I had to back out of the fight. Martin Catman fought Paul Daly. Paul Daly jumped in. And then Martin Catman lost. So since I backed out of the fight, I should have been set back. But instead, they threw me in with uh, Dan Hardy, who was already on the card against another fighter, but they put him against me and made it a title contention fight. Mm. So he only got a title contention fight because of me. Then he beat me in a decision, yep. and then he became one of the biggest stars next to you know, GSP, like as far as up and coming. He was on the cover of every magazine. He, he would, it was the first time that it was shown in theaters, so it was like these big cutouts every time we went to the theater of, of Dan Hardy and, and George St. Pierre. And I later found out, if you watch my podcast, that they used my abs – on, on Dan Hardy. Really? Yeah, because he didn't have abs <laughs> during the photo shoot. So they literally used my abs on him, which was funny. He, did he, did he, agree, he admit that? He as told well? me that on my podcast, yeah. <laughs> okay, I didn't see so that. So that would have pissed me off even more. So I hated him at that time. But yeah. no, you got to give respect. And even my last fight, I, I only fought because I built my gym. And I came out of retirement because yeah, that, yeah. the, the goal was to build a gym and then fight out of it. Even though I was older and retired and all that, it was fun. Was I that about six years ago? Yeah, I fought Alex Garcia. Yeah. It was, he was 20, 10 years younger than me, and he was just great at takedowns, and he just held me down. I mean, I didn't get beat up. I beat him up on the feet, took no damage, but it was fun. I enjoyed every second. I got to go out there that last time. It was a, it was a Conor McGregor card, so the, yeah, crowd, the crowd was insane. The weigh-ins were insane. The fight was good. I mean, it was clear that I was, like, in my opinion, the better fighter. He just held me down. So it's like I didn't take a beating. I didn't take... And at this time, you're what, probably loss. 35, 36. I was fine. Yeah, to yeah. me, it was so awesome. I have so much respect for him, and it was like, it was a great experience, even though I lost. I'm, I, AK Thailand, what I do from here on out is my, my real goal. Yeah. This, is, this is what I wanted to do. So my record didn't really uh, affect me as long as I got to the, the point where I could use that to help this. What, what advice would you pass on to UFC fighters um, that are uh, going into retirement? Because if you watch a lot of them, they're similar to, let's say, basketball players or NFL players. Some of them let go. Like, for sure, like, when guys like Patty Pimblett retire, that guy's going to get fat as shit. But yourself, I mean, you're, you're literally staying in pretty much similar to fighter shape. Why is that? I mean, that's With cancer at 42. Right. But like, where does that motivation come from? This, this is what people don't understand. Like, and if they tried it, they would understand, but they just don't because they're more lazy of the workout itself. 
to me, a win is a win, right? A win builds confidence. So when you win in the UFC, you build confidence for your next fight. So when I go into the gym, I have something in my head that I'm, I'm programmed to do. Like I want to do this much on the treadmill, this much on the weights, whatever the case. If I can go in there and get that win for the day, that's a win for me. I can go to sleep with that win. And that, to me, that, that uh, is just overall builds my confidence in everything. It just, it, even in business. Mm-hmm. And, and then if I don't get a win there, I'm, I may get a win in business. Either way. One way or another, it's like I'm, I'm, I'm tr- always trying to, to chase for wins. A win in terms of like at least you got to sweat once a day. Do some sort of I, some sort of. When exercise. I work out, I have a goal. I have a goal. So, so I go in there for chest day and I, I want to do a certain amount of reps of a certain amount of weight. And if I can do it, I get a win. And I get a somewhat of a win by even trying, of course. But if I get the win, that, that confidence is there. It's boom. Are you the, doing any one, hit or running or yeah, are you sparring everything. still? No, 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 okay. no, 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 no sports combat right now. Okay. But then, but then when I go back to my, my desk, I'm doing business at nighttime, late at night, I'm still confident from my workout. You know, I'm still, I'm still like King Kong, you know, I'm still like, I got my workout in, I got my, I hit my goals. So it's like, to me, it's like, you, you're always keeping yourself in like a positive and, and winning attitude, which helps in everything. So that's, that's, that, that's what motivates me the most at my age. My genetics are okay that I don't have to work out so much to be, I'm not just going to blow up and, and, and be, you know, whatever, but it's just, it's just that, uh, I'm addicted to the, to the, to the winning and, and achieving and feeling like I'm accomplishing comp- something. It, it helps the rest of my day or but vice even versa. Even before uh, the, the cancer, uh, you found the cancer, were, were you doing sparring or combat just for training and cardio? I wasn't, no. No, no I haven't done sparring in a long time just for head trauma. Or, or even um, not just sparring, let's say like bag work or anything like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bag work, mitt work, um, even grappling some. But just head trauma, I'm... I'm yeah, yeah, no, I understand. I'm I'm so lucky that like I got out of my career with with no brain injuries and and did stuff. Did you have you done uh, like CT scans after your career to no. just double check or? I just know that it's been over seven years when usually the stuff kicks in, so I'm just like and everything feels. I, I can be crazy smart about business and and about everything meticulous in my life when I think about stuff, but it's like when it comes to health, I I can't like I can't look it up even cancer, mm. I will not Google it. No, like when I'm, he told me that I had uh, leukemia, uh, uh, stage four uh, lymphoblastic T cell leukemia, never looked it up. But you did look up. Okay, what are we going to do next? Didn't look up anything. Mm. Just I t- won't. I you talked to it. a friend. I t- I talked to the doctors, and gotcha. I don't like talking to them. But I just, I'm just scared to look it up. Yeah, I and, know. And they could easily have said, you know, oh, you it's totally curable. You know, people live all the time, or whatever. Or it could say not. But. I just I is don't that know. because you're superstitious? I just I'm just too scared, man. I don't want to know. Uh, I don't want to think about it. like like beyond like to be honest with you. If you look at me from the time I came home from cancer, like my Instagram, I don't think about it. I don't mm-hmm. think about it. like I can't. I don't feel like it, and I don't think about it. That's why I got all jacked up on the jet ski when I took the bullet out the other day. Like I I fractured my ankle. I, I messed up my wrist, and I and I tore my uh, rotator cuff. Shit. Because my the chemo like made my body weak. Yeah. Even even though I felt good, I was going super fast, and I wrecked. And so, like, I don't think about it. I just never think about it. I don't. I don't let it drag me down. I don't let it stress me. I mean, stress that, is like a bad thing, you know. That's important. I mean, the mind is so powerful as well that this could uh, also be helping with that and, and moving forward and, and, I and can't, getting past it. And I can't change it. I'll look at stuff to like treat it, but I won't look at like my chances of living or can I cure it or can I not. It is what it is. Mm-hmm. The doctor would tell me, and he's going to have to tell me anyway. And so I don't want to see that uh, I'm going to die. And then stress out about it mm-hmm. or, 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 or vice versa and then find out something different later. I'd rather just not know and not think about it and just hope for the best. And as long as I'm doing the right things to, to prevent it, plant-based diet, no sugar, healthy lifestyle. And you're still doing plant-based right stress. now? Oh, uh, I've never stopped. Raw vegan? Or? I do have salmon. That's it. Um, and the plant, is it cooked or just raw? Everything. 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 Yeah. Cause that's what that's the biggest thing is no sugar. That's like the number one when thing. When you talk to the, Lodi, he'll say that that's what he he's like. Don't cook anything. Which, I mean, if I'm a meat eater too, like and and like you said, that I was believe the, him. It'd be quite difficult. You can you can talk to him about it as to why, but he explains the science. It's a lot to do with the colon and whatnot. But it's, for me, it's baby steps. Like I went yeah. from eating no vegetables, almost like just like meat and sugar, to like plant based. So what are you eating now? Like what would your meals be for? Today? Well, I do have salmon. So salmon's a big a big part of my protein for the day. Okay. Uh, a lot of shakes, plant-based shakes, 
and uh, like cauliflower, asparagus. I'll do burritos with like uh, refried beans, guacamole, uh, stuff like that. I was reading somewhere on when was that? It's something if you're if you cook broccoli with mustard seed the mustard seed like is a catalyst to activate this like antioxidant within the the broccoli itself or broccoli sprouts and it's supposed to be like the yeah, cancer uh saver on, on our side see we for for uh, have you looked into any medicinal mushroom stuff yet like this this is not psychedelics this is like lion's mane reishi mm. anything like that this stuff here um we, we're not getting it yet and again this is a hobby project that well we're, we're doing it we're if we start it, we start it. But to be honest, the podcast was going to be the marketing tool for this. And uh, I got into NFTs and I'm like, oh, fuck this. I'll just do the podcast and NFTs. <laughs> but anyways, um, Lion's Mane, we, we, I've done a lot of research on this because uh, Paul Stamets was on Rogan and that led me to that to get into mushrooms. And apparently like uh, Lion's Mane has proven that it reduces your chances of Alzheimer's by 60%. Um, so I don't know if that's interesting for, for fighters in the future, but you mean like liter literally lion's manes, li lion's mane, like it's a type of mushroom. Oh, okay. okay, okay so okay, gotcha. kind of looks, I was like, looks like this, like, gotcha. uh, actually this is it right here. This is it right here, but this is a dried version. Um, gotcha. but it has to be powdered and extracted. But what was, what's interesting is reishi. Um, yeah, just throw it on there. It's fine. Reishi was... It's the number one medicinal, not just mushroom, but medicine in, in Asia, specifically in China and Singapore. And it was used up until the 1950s in Japan to cure cancer. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what happened in the 1950s is the pharmaceutical companies came into Japan and replaced it with chemo. But there's mm -hmm. like super high concentrations of reishi and you can, you'd have to talk to, now these are like serious mushroom doctor oncologists where they'll literally prescribe you like dosages of reishi. The problem for cancer, let's say whether it's maintenance or you're, you're fighting it, the amount you would have to spend in terms of dollars per month would be like two, three hundred because the product that you you would be getting is just so expensive. Like, I'm not selling that. This is pure preventative stuff. And, and that's why I'm an advocate about it. Because if I, my, my grandparents had dementia and Alzheimer's, and therefore it's in my DNA. But if I can take lion's mane and just take two capsules every day, and that reduces my chances by 60%, and it's proven in literature throughout China and the UK, I mean, I'm, I might as well flip the coin and give it a shot i mean we take vitamin c we take um, omega threes we take vitamin b we, i'm sure you supplement as well so why not i just add that in i've, I've never been a believer in like plant-based and all that being so important and, and and so vital and vegetation or vegetarian diet and all that and when you get cancer you know you, you want to do everything that's uh you know, and i watch documentaries and stuff as well and I was sold at that point that it's definitely better than eating meat and whatever else. And then when I started doing it, I'm sold because like I went into the hospital with cancer with like, I think like, I think I'm off three medications that, that I was on. One was for my allergies. One was for esophageal spasm I had. So in other words, I couldn't eat a big meal and lay down because the acid would go in my throat. Yeah, I read that story on you. Yeah. Like three things that I took medicine for have been gone just from plant-based diet. Wow. Yeah, because it wasn't the chemo for sure that cured them. That's that, that's guaranteed. So like now I'm sold 100 percent that plant based diet is like definitely way better for you. Yeah, I have a friend. I feel and just uh, seems so much healthier. I had a, a guy on the podcast here. He a very interesting story. It's on our YouTube, but he lost pretty much everything during COVID. He had uh, hotels and Batong. Oh wow! And he's about my age, 36, 37, and he said, "Fuck it." He goes. I, he has a family here and they're Argentinian and great family, gorgeous family. And he said, I'm not prepared for the worst. He literally packed up and moved out to the monument area yeah. and bought land yeah. and he farms. I go, how do you survive? He goes, everything's on this fucking farm. I went and visited him yeah. and like he came on the podcast, explained it all. I went to visit his place. I show up. He's like, you want something to eat? I'm like, yeah, sure. He just took his shovel, digs up a sweet potato. He's like, take that home. He has a giant garden of just everything. He says 10% relies on the grocery store now. Yeah. And he had he has Crohn's disease, and he yeah, cured yeah, it yeah. completely on plant-based plant and fruit. He doesn't eat any meat, and it's not that he loves, he loves it, but he said the problem is it's causing inflammation in my stomach, and the second he switched to vegetarian, it was, it's gone right away. Yeah. 
um, on that positive note, uh, we'll, we'll. And I should say real quick, so yeah. J- Jay Park gets it too. I mean, this is one of the smartest guys in the world, the billionaire crypto guy that that, that has the uh, the gaming. He uh, he has uh, some of the world's most successful cancer treatment centers in the world in South Korea, and he grows the the cancer centers grow. They have farms that grow their all their food that they give to the cancer patients on site. So that's, that's the first time I've seen that happen. And, and, and so he gets it himself. Yeah. We had a long talk about it. Actually, it's pretty, pretty interesting. Um, and when I was in the hospital uh, with cancer, I wasn't eating it, of course, but they were trying to give me meat and sugar. So you're talking about a, a doctor spent, what, five, six years to, to learn cancer and be a specialist, and he's giving you sugar to, to have. Like, yeah, the- how in the world does a doctor that's a specialist in cancer not know that sugar is bad for you. Influ- uh, that's why I can't go in the 7 It was like sugar water. It was like these boxes that were like 5% juice or something. It was just insane. Yeah, yeah it's crazy. It's, it's for me, it's, uh, I can't go in a 7 I'll go in for water and come out with a Snickers bar and forget the water. Yeah. Like it's <laughs> just, it's a fucking death trap yeah. for me. But actually, no, I found out from what was going on with you from Wade because he's, uh, he, he Wade connected me to Lodi um, initially and, uh, Wade posted a story about you and I said, I'm like, oh, I follow Mike Swick. What's going on? And he's super anti-vax or anti-current situation. I don't know if YouTube bans us. And he, he was saying, and, and there's a lot, that's not just your story. Your story is popping up all over the place in the world. Uh, mm-hmm. well, let's not go into that uh, because fucking God, you, the gods of YouTube will probably just delete the account. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> But on, on that note, Mike, thanks a lot for, for joining. We've yeah, been, no I've problem. been try, I, trying to get you on for a couple, maybe a couple months, but then things happen. We understood. It's funny. When I first started this podcast, I wrote your name down and put it on a board. I think it's up there. I have, I have a goal board of people I'm going to get on. And I, and I feel uh, bad because I, I know it seems like I'm just no, putting, putting you no, off. No, because no, no, I know no. people do that all the time. They I, put I, people I, off. I completely I really it. wasn't. Like, 100%. I, just, I really just, my schedule I, and then the cancer and the, so many things happened that I was like, I just couldn't find the time to come I up give, here. And, and I give... It. Uh, people, their space, like, uh, I'm in contact with, uh, do you know who Mark Weens is? I don't know. Oh, I might know if I saw him. He's like one of the biggest Thai, uh, vloggers for food. And, but he, now he's gone worldwide, 9 million subscribers on YouTube. And I connect with these people and I, I, I believe in plant the seed, leave the information, but don't fucking hound people 20 times a day and just let it come back organically i never forgot man i was definitely going to do it for sure no no that that, and it's great that you came it's much appreciated especially like i uh was generally interested as well to hear that story i'm anti-current situation so i like to uh hear about that and understand that a little bit as well um so yeah thanks for coming on we're gonna quickly shoot it over to this camera to you and then uh, if you quickly want to uh i guess plug um, what you're doing, where people can find you in terms of YouTube, Instagram, and if they want to get in contact with AKA Thailand, or if people that are maybe in your similar situation want to uh, reach out to you as well. Yeah, sure. There's been a lot of people. Uh, that's, that camera right there. There's, there's been a lot of people that's, uh, uh, you guys that sent me uh, DMs. I'm trying to answer all of them uh, as much as I can. I'm not an expert on, on cancer, but I can definitely relate to a lot of your, your situations and, uh, and I'll help you as much as I can and uh, wish you the best, obviously AKA Thailand and, uh, yeah, just uh, thank you for the support. Uh, everyone's always been very, very supportive. Like I said before, the support that I got for for coming out with cancer, was, it was humbling to me. I never expected to get that kind of support, so it meant a lot from all you guys, and uh, it's uh, kept me strong, and uh, I hope everybody stays safe, and it's been great to be on the podcast. Thank you guys for having me, and uh, yeah, that's it. Awesome. Okay, that wraps up another episode. You know, we never know how to end these, so we're done.